Good evening, everyone. How are you? Hello, Kristen. Good evening. Hello. Oh. My camera off while I was chewing a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Lisa. Yep. Hi, Lisa. Good evening. Hi. Great. That look great. It does. Okay. Beautiful. All right. Well, let's call the meeting to order. Good evening, everyone. I will bring the meeting of December 6, 2021 of the San Carlos Planning Commission to order. And as always, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, Republic, for which it stands, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Garvey. Present. Commissioner Iacopone. Present. Commissioner Bradley. Present. Vice Chair Clements. Present. And Chair Ruth. Present. The next item on our agenda is the uh, public public comment. And public comment is in this section is limited to items that are not on the agenda. The commission may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed by the Brown Act, Government Code Section 54954.2. However, the commission's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on future commission agenda for a more comprehensive action or a report. So are there any comments from the public on items that are not on the agenda? Dara, do you have anyone in the waiting room? Not at this time. Okay. Let's move on to the next item. Then, which is approval of the minutes from our uh, our previous meeting, which was um, November fifteenth. Uh, are and there? Uh, the, yes. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Through the chair, um, staff would like to call to the commission's attention um, a rata sheet that has been provided since the packet was released, and on this slide here to the left, um, the the language that is um, shown in. Um, light blue is actually in the packet, but that's just a note reflecting that a change needs to be made. Um, since staff noticed this error, we did send out a corrected version, um, which um, basically replaces that language um, with um, the two bullets shown to the right. And so I just wanted to call uh, your attention. So that would be the correction made to the minutes that are in your packet. If you have further corrections to that, staff is willing to take those. Okay, so these are corrections to the October 18th minutes. Yes, per the motion made by the commission yeah. to correct the minutes. I, I did notice the okay. notation. Thank you for correcting that, Lisa. And uh, do we have any corrections to the minutes from the November uh, from the November meeting? Yeah, Chair Roof, if I could please. Um, uh, staff on packet page six, um, in the middle of the page, there was a reflection of some comments that I'd made. Um, and down in the like, so third or fourth sentence, it said, um, 
Commissioner Yacopone said that if the reason they are not getting more rental units is because 4.9 is not very attractive, moving to 5.0 is less attractive. I actually think that should uh, have read, um, because I believe it was my intention to say, um, if 4.9 is not very attractive, moving to 5.0 is not very much more attractive. Thank you. I noticed the same. Okay. Uh, do we have any other corrections? Okay. Hearing none. Um, can we um, have a uh, had an entertain a motion to um, approve the minutes with the with the correction that uh, Commissioner Yacoponi just mentioned? Yes, Chair. With that correction, I can I move approval of the Planning Commission meeting minutes from November fifteenth, twenty twenty one. A second. Great. We have a, a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey. Yes. Commissioner Yacoponi. Yes. Commissioner Bradley. Yes. Vice Chair Clements. Yes. And Chair Ruth. Yes. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the public hearing. Um, and the procedure for a public hearing, the staff will present a report on the history, physical features, et cetera, on the application, followed with the staff's recommendations. The applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had an opportunity to be heard, the meeting, the hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice, the, the public notice, or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Speakers should state their name prior to addressing the commission. This will assist staff in preparing the minutes. The first item in our public hearing is 104 Sunnydale Avenue. APN 051401010 and APP 2021-00007. Appeal of director approval of the location of the external stairs that provide ingress and egress to a proposed second story accessory, accessory dwelling unit. Staff, ready with your presentation? Yes. Good evening, Commissioners and Chair Roo. My name is Sarah Cadona, Contract Assistant Planner with the City of San Carlos. The item before you is a request for an appeal of the Director's decision to approve the location of, ex of an external staircase accessing a second-story ADU over an attached garage at 104 Sunnydale. The approved plans show a first-story addition and a second story ADU over an attached garage. The project site is just over 6,000 square feet located in the RS single family residential zoning district. The proposed two bedroom ADU will be about 790 square feet. Here are the existing conditions of the residents at 104 Sunnydale. This lot is located on the corner of Sunnydale Avenue and Elm Street where the garage and the front door are located on Sunnydale's street frontage. On the aerial view map, the red arrow indicates the location of the appellant at 1730 Elm Street. Staff first received this application on September 23rd, 2020, and during the review process for the ADU, staff as well as the applicant were both in contact with HCD which is California's Housing and Community Development Department, for further interpretation on AB 68, which is the law that regulates ADU dwelling unit, accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs. This current ADU law does not specifically address requirements for second-story ADUs over attached garages. HCD finally concluded that second-story ADUs over attached garages shall default to the municipality's second-story setback requirements. 
The project applicant then worked with the building and planning division to find a design that meets the ingress and egress requirements while providing access to the ADU. Staff then approved the project on September 30th, 2021. Shortly after the neighbor at 1730 Elm Street filed an appeal on October 8th, 2021. Staff then met with the city attorney to discuss the scope of the appeal because ADUs are ministerially approved according to the ADU law AB 68. The city attorney found that the only appealable item was the staircase location. Here are the appellant's concerns that were listed in her reasonings for the appeal in which staff has reviewed and responded to. The concern marked in red highlight um, is the appealable concern as staff had discretion on the staircase location. The appellant's other concerns noted above in black text do however meet our code requirements and therefore cannot be appealable. In the code section 1823210 subsection E4G, it states that balconies, decks, or open staircase landings that face the rear or side property line nearest the accessory dwelling unit shall not be permitted except as needed to allow ingress and egress. This led to city staff making a discretionary decision on the location of the stairs. The size and location of the approved staircase and balcony meet the minimum building requirements to allow for ingress and egress. This is an example of one of the previous proposed designs for the staircase and balcony. The external stairs would be located on the side of the garage and lead to a large open balcony. The balcony was proposed to be around 250 square feet. This proposed staircase slash balcony design does not meet code requirements as the language states as allowed for ingress and egress, which would mean that, the, that it must be near the minimum requirements and only allow for access to the ADU, not a large open space, which could be used for other purposes. Here's the proposed site plan. I have outlined the ADU and the staircase for reference. The proposed addition meets all setback requirements. Here's the first floor plan. As you can see, the staircase will need to cut into the wall of the garage. However, it still allows for the same number of parking spaces for the main residence. This slide shows the approved floor plan for the ADU and the stairs slash access walkway needed for ingress and egress. Here are the elevations where you can see the different angles of the staircase slash walkway. The applicant for the ADU, as well as the appellant located at 1730 Elm Street, were able to provide a 3D rendering of the staircase. The appellant at 1730 Elm Street is currently in the construction process for building a new two-story home and has created a proposed rendering on the right that shows what both completed projects would look like. This slide shows the appellant's suggested location for the staircase. This would mean that the staircase and the walkway would move toward the street side property line on Sunnydale Avenue. Staff finds that the appellant's proposed alternative location is not of equal benefit as the approved location, which result in a design that is less cohesive and the removal of one covered parking space for the main residence. This slide shows a neighborhood outreach and public noticing. On November 23rd, staff mailed public notices to all property owners within 300 foot radius. And since staff has received no neighborhood concerns about this project. Here, <clears throat> here's the motion if you choose to accept it. Staff as well as the appellant and the applicant are present to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Uh, are there any clarifying questions from commissioners before we um, open up for public comment? Should we, does, does the appellant want to make a presentation? Should we do that before we invite public comment? Uh, Chair, um, at the right time, I do have one question for staff, but it can wait if uh, we would like the appellant to um, speak first. Um, Dara, do we, is the appellant um, queued up to, um, to give a presentation or are we uh, gonna move forward from here? Yes, if I can. Hello, welcome. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Sumaya and uh, Maddie is my husband. Uh, so we are the tenant of 1730 on the street. And uh, I mean, as I mentioned in my appeal, uh, the concern is that the staircase uh, could have been designed differently. So it wouldn't be very close, like within a five, five foot of the fence. So I was just testing myself. I'm a petite person, five foot two inch, and I was able to easily not even jump, just step uh, hard to get to the five foot distance. So it's really bothering us because the stair, the, the intermediate landing of the stair is right at the height of the fence. So anybody easily could just jump over and come to our backyard and it is a blind corner not not no no camera can catch it and it just feels really unsafe and i have i know that the planning department uh, objected other uh, concern in the appeal uh, so i'm not going to bring them up um, i'm not convinced and i don't know how we can just uh um, petition their uh, answer to our other concerns, but I'm going to focus on the stair for now. So I have a neighbor, um, I saw that there is no concern um, from other neighbors, but uh, I was in contact with our neighbor on 108 Sunnydale, and I believe she wants to, um, and her representative wants to talk to so uh, this is not just my concern, it is their concern as well. Um, and I would really appreciate it if you can just imagine uh, one landing five foot away from your fence. And it, it is really, it just feel, feel unsafe for our neighborhood. And the fact that uh, this ADU unit could be rented uh, Within like within the thirty days rental uh, period, it 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 makes it worse because if it was for our neighbor, obviously we would have no concern because we know them and they're really good people and we're happy that they're going to have a second story and they're going to have a new home. But it, we are thinking about the potential that this project is going to bring. Uh, and this is the time that we can just uh, look carefully, but if we pass this project and approve it, then that's done. And we cannot have any, um, I, don't know, we, I don't know how else we can control the situation if we don't do it now. So um, yeah, ADU being a rental property makes it, really hard for us to understand how the planning department doesn't um, uh, doesn't address our concerns at all. And they think that this is uh, absolutely within the code that um, the second landing, it's within the five foot set, within the nine foot second story setback, because usually for the second story wall, they need to have nine foot setback. So I understand that the planning department helped them with, uh, with just uh, getting exception uh, for the 30% length of the first floor wall. 
and I sent already my question to the planning commissions and the planning department, how they can justify that one side of the building could be cantilever off of the first floor and create a bulky mass, uh, let alone they just did it for the second uh, story toward our side and created a two-story mass. And besides that, they also introduce a land intermediate landing and stair within the nine foot setback of the second story. And I don't find any exemption that led them to have the uh, stair within the second floor setback when they have like 30 foot length to have the stair. And with respect to the planning department uh, response in terms of like garage space uh, being uh, not efficient if they move the stair, uh, there are some other design modification they could do it to the stair. Like they, they could have just the one pass stair and then directly go to the ADU instead of introducing intermediate landing and then go to the space of the garage. So there are so many ways of moving the stair towards Sunnydale uh, and still have a two-car garage. So okay. uh, yeah, that was my <laughs> comment. On okay, thank you, for your, thank you for your input. And I think now I'll open it up for commissioners to ask um, clarifying questions of the staff or the appellant. Um, and then we'll perhaps, open it for public uh, comment. Uh, yes, the chair, perhaps the the person, the interested party, the real party in interest, might have a presentation. Oh, oh absolutely! If there is, please um, let let's do that. Would the um, 104 Sunnydale owner owners like to make a presentation now? Yes, I think we're working on getting them over to panelists. So just one second. Okay. Chair, while we're doing that, if we could again see the diagram or the 3D modeling slide. Yes, thank you. Just to understand what the concern is. Thank you. So, look, this is uh, Greg Hilton can, and Ying Fang. Uh, no, no, can you, you can start video oh, and then okay. people can see you better. Um, okay, now we see you. Okay. Oh, hi. All right. Hi, welcome. Hello. Hello. So, I'm Greg and Ying Fang and our daughter Karina. Yeah. Uh, we're at the at uh, 104 uh, Sunny. So, yeah, we've worked, we were working back and forth with the city uh, as seen in the agenda packet. We actually had quite a few other proposals for different stair locations. Um, and it was ultimately the, the final one that got approved, which was uh, the only one that the, the city was uh, was willing to approve. Um, it, we, were, we didn't get any suggestions in other ways on how to modify uh, the plans to still have uh, stairs accessible to the ADU. Uh, we've been talking with our uh, next door neighbor um, at 108 Sunnydale as well. So, I mean, after looking at all the plans, reviews, um, you know, I know that they're, and I believe they're going to speak once it comes to the public comment section. Um, I know they personally would prefer if we could go to uh, what's listed as uh, Proposal 2, uh, as described in the agenda packet on page, I believe it's 36. Um, obviously, shrink, remove the deck uh, to just make it so it meets the uh, egress ingress requirements. Uh, our only concerns about any changes at this point in time is just how it would slow down our project. We've spent uh, over a year to, I mean, from the start of the project, trying to figure out how we want our own floor plan internally. Uh, the stairs was the last item. We spent, I think, two months going back and forth. So our biggest concern is really um, getting the project moving forward. Thank you. Um, and our 
uh, I believe our designer David's on. So if he wants to add anything, uh, he could add for us. Thank you. And actually, there's uh, one thing I want to say is um, Karina. I, I talked to Sumeya on tax. Um, you know, she found out that our plan approved and this was not her first line of concern of the stair location, but mainly like we open a window toward her yard and that um, compromise her yard privacy. And then she did tax me is basically it's like if I move my window, you know, the bedroom window facing a yard and she's okay with the rest. And then for me, it's kind of like, well, if I meet cold, then it meet cold. That's what I heard, right? And then when she built her house um, back in 2020, I think, or applying for the uh, permitting process, whatever, we give full support to her. You know, she has a balcony looking fully directly to our yard, 100%, no screening tree whatsoever. I did not complain at all because I just believe that, you know, this is the people's land. They build whatever they want as long as me cold. And then um, I'm just disappointed that we didn't get the same green light. And then, you know, for the stair location, I know she explained it's a very like people really like jumping from the stair to the fence. But um, I talked to like multiple people and people is like, well, if people really want to jump over the fence, they don't, they will not really go to the stair and jump. They just hop over the fence, you know? So um, I, I I don't see how a stair five feet setback meeting a call. How does it like endanger the security? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, if, if your architect had something that, it, they wanted to I'm, say immediately we could take that or we could just have that person available for questions. I'm here and I'll be available for questions. My name is David Kwapamaki. Um, Hi. Welcome. I did, thank you. I did have stuff to say, but Sarah did such an incredible job on her presentation that she pretty much covered everything that I would say. So I'll Excellent. be here for questions if you guys need and um, felt that it's not necessary to reiterate what she's already put in. Okay, thank you. So, so what we'll do now is we'll open it for clarifying questions from the commissioners. Then we'll open it for public comment if there is any, oh, and then we'll and then thing. we'll um, and then we'll have our commissioner deliberation. So, commissioners, um, any clarifying questions for the staff or for um, the other people who have presented? Well, maybe I'll start off with with one. Just and please keep this renderings picture up. It's very useful. The um, just to make sure I understand the distances here. The distance from the fence to the railing, the horizontal distance, that's five feet. Am I am I correct there? Yeah, that's um, correct. Five feet. And the height. What what's the height of the top of the railing? That um, I'm just trying to get a feeling for. Um, the scale here a little better the height of the, of the either of the platform and or the railing um what are we talking one second and i'll get that for you mm -hmm. the, the i i believe yeah the, the this is greg i believe the the railing should be about a similar height to the roof line which is, um, where is that, 10 feet, 11 feet, I believe. Uh, maybe it should be able to get more exact yeah. answer. So the land, the, the mid landing, um, where mm -hmm. it turns 90 degrees, is at six feet, 11 inches from the ground. Mm -hmm. And then the railing would be at 10 feet, five inches. That's the yeah. intermediate one. Is that the one that you're right. asking about? Uh, yeah, I guess that's the one yeah. that would be the that kind of provides the most um, access to jumping yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. And if um, yep. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And um, are there questions from clarifying questions from the commissioners before we open for public comment? Yes, I see Commissioner Yacaponi has his hand raised. Oh, thank you. Sorry, got to get that. Thank you. Um, that is a question for staff. In in our packet that you provided, and I think um, maybe the uh, the owners of 104 Sunnydale referenced this. On page 36, there is uh, what's labeled as Proposal 2. 
Is, can staff say why uh, that was uh, not approved? So proposal number two, you're referencing um, the staircase that is located more towards the street frontage of Sunnydale Avenue leading to, so it would be, it would look like this proposal, but the staircase is closer to the Sunnydale side. Is that correct? Yes. So that wasn't approved because it also has a large balcony like this and a large balcony would not be allowed um, because we need to allow um, as needed for ingress and egress. So this is much larger and would allow for um, other functional activities like you can put chairs or tables out there for enjoyment where this code section purely restricts and talks about just accessing the ADU. Okay, thank you. I, I was thinking that might be the case. And so this the follow-up would be if there was a scenario where there were no permitted balcony, meaning it were gravel roof or uh, with railings on both sides and the only purpose was to walk across that part of the garage into the unit. Does would that change the conclusion of staff? Um, so you're saying, I guess, move or have the staircases located in proposal to and have a railing that goes straight across for access? Yeah, on, on both sides of what effectively is a walkway from the top of the stair and the landing into the home. I guess I'm just trying to separate if, mm -hmm. you know, is there a scenario, this is just what occurred to me looking at the diagrams here, was that mm -hmm. is there a scenario that doesn't have the, the landing, it doesn't have a return, it doesn't move it close to the neighbor's house, it serves the function of acceptable ingress and egress, and the yeah, and therefore uh, allows the us to have, you know, kind of like a happy medium between all parties. And, so that and was not, definitely, uh, yeah, that's, that's so fine. That, was, that could be an option, but um, staff thought if the railing was, the railing in the walkway was more towards the street side, it would be more visible to anyone from the street, and it would be, it's less preferable just from an aesthetic and a viewpoint. And through the chair, if I could uh, just jump in quickly, uh, Andrea Mardisich, principal planner, um, to just go along with what Sarah was talking about. Um, our, our biggest concern from the beginning was um, as shown on the plans, the large balcony. Um, so once we, you know, we got a proposal that didn't include that, we were then trying to figure out a way to grant access to this ADU. Um, and there were, there were a lot of different options in addition to what's shown tonight. Um, one option was the stairs punching through the garage roof. Um, another was the stairs at the midpoint. Um, but, to, but to kind of boil down the answer to that, the biggest concerns that we need to comply with are, are that it's meeting the setbacks and any fire or building code requirements. Um, so if the scenario you proposed did both of those, then I think it is something um, that could be approvable. It would just be sort of the outstanding item would be how cohesive is it with the rest of the house in terms of aesthetics, um, if, that, if that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Maybe my, my observation looking at this on the screen is, um, I'll call it, from the top of the landing at the back of the property to the ingress door is quite a bit of the roof of the garage already. 
in fact, we might end up with smaller portion and a, therefore a smaller landing. Um, so I, the reason I'm raising this is because in our packet, we were proposed, uh, we, we were provided three options, one of which is, is there an alternative? Um, so vote yes and support, vote no against support, or come up with an alternative in this I'll leave it to my other commissioners to weigh in, but that was my thought on what might be a middle ground. Thank you. Are there questions? Oh, Commissioner Clements, did, did I see your hand? No, I don't. Let me. Yes, Chair, if I could just quickly okay. follow up on that idea. Um, the comments. I think I heard that the, is it 103 Sunnydale neighbor, the other side neighbor, um, uh, what were their thoughts about different placements of the stairs? I had thought that different placements were kind of more intrusive from their perspective. So I feel like it's a balance between both neighbors and how visible the stairs are or how intrusive they are, um, you know, look and feel. So did they have input on that? It's possible they'll call in for the public comment part, but does staff know do I, the neighbors so at 103? Yes, we heard they didn't have formal written right. feedback, but Andrea, I don't know if you've spoken to anyone who seemed to. Uh, I don't believe so. This was all done at staff level, um, but I think staff's you know, perspective was the, the approved location was at the rear corner yard of both properties, um, whereas the way that the lot is laid out, um, those stairs are located along the side yard of 108 Sunnydale. Um, so the, the rear of this lot backs up to the side of the neighbor on Sunnydale. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, the least intrusive place would be what was approved. Um, so that, that was our, our line of thinking at the time. Right, and something that kind of comes forward more a little bit further forward to, you know, I just don't know how it interfaces with their home and whether they had a preference. And the problem solving kind of uh, vein that Commissioner Iacopone had started down. Thanks. I have a clarifying question, um, and then we'll get to Commissioner Garvey. Sorry, sorry, I just noticed you, but I'll ask mine. Um, the, uh, if you were to pull the stairs um, toward Sunnydale Avenue, uh, the landing, the mid landing would still be positioned to allow somebody to, to jump, if they could jump that way, into the neighbor at 103 Sunnydale in the same way, I guess. I mean, so it would solve the problem um, for, the, um, for the Elm Street neighbor, but um, it would be the same issue for the uh, 103 Sunnydale, I suppose, that mid landing would still be along the, yeah, property, chair, property, just, off the property line. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, please go ahead. I was just going to say, what I was suggesting was eliminating the landing and eliminating or mm -hmm. effectively eliminating the turn, right? Yeah. yeah. So just, but uh, I Maybe that's consistent with what you were just sharing as well. well. Well, I was also thinking one of the the other the proposal, I think maybe the maybe it was the appellant. It's on the packet page forty three where in pink, they pulled that um, the yellow horseshoe stairway structure toward Sunnydale Avenue. Um, that that was the um, other the alternative that page forty three, which. And I was trying to clarify that that mid landing would would still be above the um, 103 Sunnydale neighbor, but not the um, Elm Street neighbor. Yes, that one. Well, and that was the proposal that way that removed a parking space. Yes, that's right. Right, which is really inefficient. Yeah, so that so that's right. So I just wanted to clarify the distance. I guess we can weigh the pros and cons when we get to our discussion. Yeah. But I, I kind of want to make sure to see if, um, well, we have a question from Commissioner Garvey, and um, and then if, uh, if we don't have more commissioner clarifying questions, we'll open for public comment. Commissioner Garvey? Uh, thank you, Chair Roof. Just one comment. In looking at the renderings, if we uh, pull the stairs closer to Sunnydale, 
it looks as though the stairs then cover a utility box. So this could create some function issues as well as some code issues that may have to be thought about. Okay. And and I guess my only comment on the on the on the safety issue is, I think it's a lot. If I wanted to hop over the fence, I think it would be a lot easier to just hop over the fence than it would be to get over a ten foot five inch railing, and hop down. That that I I don't think is is doable. Okay, let's talk about that more when we get to our um, deliberation. Um, I don't see additional question, clarifying questions from the commissioner. So can we um, uh, open for public comment? Is there the introductory slide for that? Yes, and Chair, I see uh, someone registering in the Q and A. Okay, so let's make sure that they get um, that they make it through the um, the system <laughs> so we can hear them. So um, now we're in the public comment part. If you would like to make a public comment on agenda item 6A, 104 Sunnydale Avenue, now is the time to speak. You may join the Zoom meeting at the address shown here or the phone number and enter the meeting ID and virtually raise your hand by clicking on the raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine then star six to unmute when called upon. And uh, we ask for a, a two minute um, time period for for each public commenter. So Dara, do we have uh, people in the waiting room for public comment? Yes, Fred, you kick, um, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. Welcome Fred. I, I don't hear you yet, Fred. I think we need to get Fred unmuted. If you press star six, you should be able to unmute yourself. Fred, you're unmuted. Fred, we don't hear you yet. Well, Dara, is there anyone else? Maybe we could um, in the waiting room while we get Fred worked yes. out. Um, Michael Patrick. Hello, Michael. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Uh, so, uh, Lisa, my wife and I are the people who uh, you've been talking about. Uh, we are the ones who are right next door to the staircase. It's 108 Sunnydale, not 103. Oh, thank you for that. Um, we feel very strongly in favor of moving the stairs forwards towards Sunnydale Avenue. It actually makes a really big difference to us. Um, right now, the proposal that's been approved would have the turnabout and the landing looking straight down into one of our windows. If you move the um, stairs forwards towards Sunnydale Avenue along the lines recommended, or at least the, the question asked by Commissioner Iacopone, uh, that would be ideal for us because that portion of our house further towards Sunnydale Avenue doesn't have windows. So just pushing those stairs forwards makes a very big positive impact for us. We're very concerned about noise, traffic issues in the stairs, um, and um, think that because this is something that the staff or, or the, the commission has discretion on, that uh, we would hope you would take into account our strongly held feelings that we'd like to see the stairs move forward um, along the lines of proposal two and that staff look at ways to make that work. I understand that the current proposal may not be perfect. There may be issues with moving utilities, but these seem to me to be things that are addressable within the boundaries of discretion um, given the fact that we feel that this is having the current proposal that's been approved would have 
a, a negative impact on us and um, moving the stairs forward would, would have a very positive impact on us. Um, so we'd ask that you all um, look further at alternatives at, uh, that would mitigate a very strong negative impact on us uh, at the present time. We didn't comment earlier because we hadn't seen these plans before they were approved. We have no problem with our neighbors building the ADU. We just want those stairs moved forward to Sunnydale Avenue in a way that doesn't cut into their garage. And I think that is achievable. I think there, there's a clear way they can run the stairs longer from, back from Sunnydale Avenue. Uh, and to the point about, oh, the stairs will be too visible from the street, I think there's a very simple solution, which is build a screen in front of those stairs that blocks the view of the stairs from the street. Um, and since we're in discretionary territory here, it seems to me the balance, um, you know, would favor move the stairs forward, screen the stairs so they're not visible, have the stairs run all the way up in one run so they're not cutting into the garage when they turn. So you're preserving garage space and um, you're, you're addressing a, a really serious concern that we have about impact on our property and um, noise and privacy issues. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that input. Uh, Dara, do we um, have additional people in the waiting room for public comment? Yes. Caller, under, caller ending in 924, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. Hello, please give us your name. Hello, that took a while. This is Fred Yukich. Oh, wonderful. Can you hear me now? Welcome. Yes. yes. I had to wait for the machine to tell me what to do. So okay. <laughs> anyway, give me permission. A lot of permissions here. Uh, Fred Yukich, I own the property at 112 Sunnydale, which is on the other side of 118, so I'm not adjacent. Um, what I did hear here was that the HCD, the uh, state, defaulted to local ordinances. Uh, it, in, in those local ordinances, one thing it says is they shall not be permitted except as needed. So first I would say I don't see a need here for ingress and egress at the specific location that's being proposed. It doesn't need to be there. Um, and I thought also second, there was another case and I didn't get it quick enough where they're not really meeting some of the city requirements with the, uh, maybe it was the balcony rather than the staircase, but clearly there was something there. My third point is that it's really not consistent with the neighborhood. There are not exterior staircases in the neighborhood to my knowledge that I can think of. Um, and most of the properties are masked to the front of the house, kind of consistent with what uh, Michael Patrick was saying. And even to have the stairs, they should be masked closer to the front, even aesthetically, instead of, I don't know if they're trying to hide them back there or, so you'd have to walk along, you know, a, a fence and a, the wall of the garage to get to the staircase seems like you're sort of hiding it back there. So I would suggest that there's some other solution. I don't have a solution and that's up to the applicant, I think, to um, come up with a solution. And so therefore you should um, uphold the appeal, I think is the appropriate, if that's the appropriate motion. Thank you. And I don't know how to unmute. How do I unmute now? Or you'll take care of that for me. Uh, thank you very much. Dara, do we have additional callers? Yes, Lisa, um, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. Lisa, we don't hear you. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Welcome. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm Lisa Noble and I'm at 108 Sunnydale and you heard my husband Mike speak. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I just wanted to emphasize um, what a positive impact it would be for us if the staircase could be moved forward, as um, my husband described, and as also one of the commissioner, commissioners was asking about, um, it's a, it would be a modification of proposal two, where you have a straight stairway run from the front of the property or the house up to the um, appropriate level 
Um, so, it would, so you would then just turn and head right to the door. Um, that would be a, be a huge improvement for us because we're concerned about um, just the, the traffic that you would get with a two bedroom unit that could be potentially rented to um, multiple adults or a family with kids um, and uh, thinking about UPS deliveries, FedEx, um, Amazon and all that just to have traffic that's three feet away from our window that looks right onto that proposed location of the staircase, um, I think would be really unduly intrusive when, then there, when there is a less intrusive alternative available um, that, that, uh, that I, yeah, I think it would be just a, could be a, a workable solution for everybody. Um, and it also has the benefit too of alleviating the concerns from our Elm Street neighbor as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your input. Sarah, do we have additional callers? Greg and Ying Fong, your hand is still raised if you would like to speak. Yeah, it's just I want to add on this um, fact that um, I forgot to mention previously is um, this uh, ADU is really intended for my parents and they are waiting for this to fully retire. So I am not really intended to really rent it out, just like, you know, like high turnover or whatever. So, you know, they're like in their 60 something. So maybe I think, I hope they live long enough, it's like 20, 30 years for both of them. So it's not this like high tenant turnover concern for me. Um, I understand the neighbor's concern as well, but I just want to, just, this is just one thing that my mom told me many times. She spoke to me, she's like, you know, it takes so long to get this done. I mean, and she's not in her best day of health. So I really want this project to keep moving and have her move in when she's still healthy enough to enjoy it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Dara, is that everyone lined up the call? Lisa, your hand is still raised if you would like to speak. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to reply to what Yu Fang just said. Um, totally, totally appreciate her point about her intention of wanting to have this accommodation for her parents and that that's her intent for long into the future. Um, but the decisions we make today or, or at present on this property um, have impact for the long term and no one can predict the future. And although we might have every, she might have every intention of having her parents be there, that's, that's, not, um, that's not necessarily what would happen. There is a possibility that perhaps they sell the house, you know, in the future and somebody else is uh, making the rental decisions on that two bedroom apartment. Um, so, you know, although I appreciate what she's saying, that doesn't really give me comfort. So we would definitely greatly appreciate having the stairs move forward toward closer to Sunnyvale. Sunnydale to just alleviate the, the concern that we have with the present location relative to our window. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any new callers that we haven't hit on yet? No callers. Oh, uh, one more. Caller ending in 470. You have two minutes to speak and you are now unmuted. Welcome. Please give us your name. You know, I don't hear you yet. Hi, this is Erin Hilton. You might recognize the name. It is the same name as my son, who does live across the street from me. And I understand there's a lot of anxieties about the always change in our neighborhood, but we are a good neighborhood. And I think it's a good discussion we're having tonight. But we support our neighbors and you know they're they're not about to sell this house this is a family this is a family on one side of the street and the other side of the street so that is not the point they're not going to jump over a fence and violate anybody's security they're not going to make a lot of noise and violate the calmness of sunnydale i really want you to look at the human side of what we're talking about here we're talking about families in the community here on Sunnydale and in San Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, do we have any other callers who we have not heard from yet? 
no callers at this time. Thank you. In that case, um, I think I would entertain a motion to close the public comment period. I moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to roll call, please. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Yacoponi? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Okay, now we're at the deliberation um, stage of our discussion for this item. Uh, and we've heard a variety of, um, of perspectives. Where, where are we landing on this? Um, Commissioner Clements, would you like to start off? Thank you, Chair. I have a question and a comment. Um, first, perhaps the comment, um, if I may, I understand, you know, we all have fairly small lots here. Um, in San Carlos, it is a cute place that we live in. And so um, I understand the desire for privacy and to um, try to maintain what we've got because it is, um, our setbacks are pretty small. Um, I also hear in the comments, I appreciate the last caller. Um, I hear echoes of, um, I'm gonna call it othering, which disturbs me. The idea that somebody who we don't know who doesn't already live on Sunnydale or in White Oaks could move in. And if it is not the parents of these nice people, that it is a renter, that somehow a renter could cause danger to the neighborhood. And I wanna just say for the record, all of us have rented, all of us are kind people, it seems. And I would hate to think that we are concerned about safety from people who have been screened by our neighbors who we supposedly trust. Um, you know, and so I, I am hoping that we are not anti-renter in this conversation. And that is really how it strikes me when we're talking about concerns about folks vaulting into folks in neighbors' yards. That is not that is not normal behavior and it is not what renters generally do. So I just want to say for the record that disturbs me if that's the implication. So I want to ask an architecture question um, and a cost question, which is, um, again, what does it look like um, to have, I guess, a variation on alternative two to run one long stairs, set of stairs without a turn, which it sounds like both neighbors prefer. What would that do to dimensions cost and cost? for this project, the architect could comment. Yeah, so if we were to put the landings straight out, like they're saying over the roof and then have the landing on the outside of the garage and stairs going down, um, the stairs would go past the existing front garage wall by almost three feet, two feet, 11 inches. Um, so we would need to put a fence because you have to have a three foot landing at the bottom of the stairs. So we'd have to have a fence in front of that um, to hide it um, at a minimum, which would then put a, a, a fence or a screening fence at 14 feet from the property line, um, which would then also be five feet in front of, or six feet in front of the garage. Um, cost. I mean, there's small. Sorry, costs. you just said it, the stairs would protrude six feet in front of the garage. Uh, three feet in front of the garage, and then you also need a three foot landing in and then front the landing. of the landing. Yeah. Okay. Of three so feet. they're quite visible. Got it. Okay. And now cost. Um, costs are, I would say, probably close to similar. You still have exterior stairs that are being built, whether they're at a 90 or straight. We're still having a landing area that is you know, built next to the roof. So it'd be very similar. Um, there would be, of course, small costs for the client of redoing plans, uh, put some small engineering changes and some small architectural changes. 
but nothing drastic, if um, that answers your question. Thanks. And can I ask staff any cost to resubmit and have another round of review? Um, through the chair, I don't believe they've submitted formally for permits yet. I'm not sure if that's the case, um, but this is minor enough of a change that we would just review it as part of the building permit set and planning would not take in additional fees. Um, and also to add to that, I know the homeowners mentioned a concern with timing. Um, so that's something we could definitely work on um, with them too, to do it you know, simultaneously with building. So it's not adding additional time on our end. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and then I'll ask one other question, which is about um, parents. Um, how many who may or may not love climbing stairs? After a while, I know my father's knees are not what they used to be, and he has difficulties. So how many steps would there be? And uh, so this would be one continuous stretch of stairs with no resting point. How many, how many stairs estimated? Could there be? Uh, I'm showing 19 stairs. My dad would not make it up that, but my dad is older than <laughs> than the than the residents' parents. But you know, God willing, they also make it into their 90s. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's all, Chair. Additional comments from commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Garvey. I'm, I'm, thank you, Chair Roof. I'm thinking about this six foot protrusion in the front. Andrea, can you refresh my memory? What are the setback requirements for the front and does it still meet those? Uh, sure, let me just, there's uh, specific requirements uh, that are more lenient for stairs and landings. So uh, I will look that uh, up. Okay. Okay. Right now. Um, so the way this lot is oriented also, um, even though this is the, the front of the house in terms of the garage and front door, for setback purposes, it's considered an exterior side setback. Um, the front setback is actually off of Elm Street. Um, so the setback for that side of the house is seven and a half feet. Um, and then the stairs and landing can encroach into that a, a, a little bit, I believe. I'll check what that is. Um, a, a second question, if I might. Many people um, have a driveway that's paved a few feet wider than their garage to give them a little bit more room to get out of their cars, et cetera. Is this applicant considering doing that? And would that in be encroaching at all on the new staircase or the, the six foot protrusion? Is, is I, I, I just can't envision. How, what that would be like, that last feet, six feet of the driveway, you would be limited, I think, in your width, but maybe that wasn't an issue to begin with. The garage door um, isn't completely to the left side of the garage, so we would still have a, usually the driveways kind of are in line with the garage door opening. Um, so we would still, have oh, three and a half feet or something like that. And, and one final question for the architect, if I might. David, do you see an, a, a problem with the stairs if we move them forward to Sunnydale, um, covering up the utility box? And, and is that able to be relocated or is yeah, that? So, so, sorry to, uh, right now there's a gas meter and an electric meter right there. And we were also gonna propose to put a second gas and second electric for the ADU. Um, so we would just have to move that with PG&E. Um, moving meters with PG&E is notoriously complicated, time consuming and not fun. Uh, we try to not move them if possible, but that being said, it's not the end of the world and can be done. Um, Thank you. That, did that cover everything? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, but just picking up on that, that could cause delay. 
with PG&E's approval of the new location. I'm sorry, that was what was the question? That? Sorry, David, that was a question. Um, huh? does, that could take additional time for PG&E to approve the new location. Yes, uh, it's, yeah, they are very slow yeah. for yeah. the for moving gas meters and approving them and all That's that. That's my understanding also, yeah. It's kind of a nightmare. Um, yeah. Thanks. But it is something that is doable. It just takes a long time. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll take my turn to um, give my impression here. And first, I'd like to acknowledge the context of ADUs and the new ADU laws that we um, work under now allow these to be built. And um, we have to provide ingress and egress. So stairways are a new thing that we're dealing with here. Uh, it's, it's probably worth it for us to be spending this time grappling with the issues that they pose because it's, it's not going to be the last time, I suspect. Uh, but it is a new uh, a new situation. So it, it um, with the um, with the new ADU rules where um, we have to accommodate them. Um, my second thought is that I the comments about um, privacy resonate with me. Um, I can see how if somebody um, you know it's pretty close distances, um, and so the privacy concerns I think are are valid. I mean there is a five foot. Uh, distance, but still, that's pretty close, and, and it is right over the, uh, the the previously private areas of the backyards of the neighbors. So that's a, that weighs pretty heavily on me. The danger of somebody leaping uh, it must be more than ten feet uh, drop uh, in a five foot horizontal sounds uh, that that doesn't sound too likely. And I and and we've already pointed out that the um, you know, jumping over a fence or something could be in the same realm of um, a possibility. So. Um, so the, the security um, concern resonates for me personally a little bit less, but the, uh, the, the privacy does. And, and having a neighborhood compatibility, uh, you know, we want to try to mitigate the privacy concerns as much as is practical uh, within the realms of, uh, you know, what, what's reasonable and still let an ADU be built without having um, uh, unnecessary uh, delays, which is also not appropriate. And so, I mean, so um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat tending towards saying it's okay the way it is if the um, if the owners um, it, it would be willing to um, look into a way to pull that back um, in an, in an efficient way. Um, you know, perhaps we could. Um, you know, I'll, I'll toss it out there, and then we'll continue getting input from other commissioners. You know, we might be able to continue the item to the next meeting, and then um, and then um, finish up um, if there's a slightly modified um, plan. Those are my comments. Um, I see, Ellen, you have uh, additional. Uh, comments? Thank you, Chair Roof. I, I forgot I had one additional comment. I have um, neighbors who have a, a similar situation with the landing. In order to give more privacy to both of us. They, there's a narrow, they, they've planted on the, on the landing a narrow pot that has um, bamboo, I think it is, something that it just provides a little screen so that there's not direct eye contact or direct ability to, to look through. It's a very lovely green shield. It doesn't take up much space. Um, and so, I, it, you know, I'll just offer that as, a, as another suggestion as to how to uh, address the privacy issue if we were to keep it the same. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Clements. Thanks, Chair. Um, your comment about um, we need to support building of ADUs, I, I do want to throw my hat in that ring as well um, because, you know, the state laws were changed because there were so many conversations across the state about, you know, well, we can't really do them here or it wouldn't really be compatible there or they had appeals that really made um, construction so costly that it wasn't really feasible for a lot of people. And um, ADUs can be quite costly to build, especially if you're trying to make the character match the neighborhood. Um, so, uh, so that is the reason that the state laws were passed. It is it is to facilitate uh, ADUs to be built with certainty without um, 
lengthy consideration and design changes and concerns that it's underparked and blah, blah, blah. So um, because it's it was such a problem all over the state. So anyway, I, I wanted to just say to the the um, the owners of this building, I'm thrilled that you're doing this. This I love the house the way it is. I'm excited to see what it looks like once the ADU is built on top. And I, I think it's wonderful that it's going to be multi-generational housing because it is so hard to have parents and have children and have, you know, all kinds of folks living in this area the way it is. There's so little rental housing um, the way it is. So anyway, I just, uh, you know, all other things being equal, I, I hate to um, change what is uh, a compliant set of plans um, if there are other alternatives that would, you know, that really are going to cause delay for this family that's been working on this for so long um, already. So um, just wondering if there's something that could be done quickly without altering the path of this too long. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Iacoponi. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a process question, um, so maybe one of staff can help. Uh, we have a motion that has been proposed to support the decision of the director. If if that is not approved, what happens? Staff, can you answer that, please? Yeah, this, this is Greg Rubin's uh, city attorney. Uh, if it's if it's not a if this is if this is not approved, um, I mean we need to have a decision on what what um, is necessary. I forget the right term, but the what what is required to to provide access to the unit that's mandatory under our ordinance. So the real question is just where is it going to be? And you've been grappling with that. I, uh, I've heard though that during the during this uh, matter. Um, if somebody doesn't like the the location that you put, that could be appealed up to the city council. Okay, make... Thank thank you for that. that that's clear. Um, so my my reflection would be um, the homeowner said that they preferred some version of option two. Um, both. The neighbor to the rear and the neighbor to the side said that, well, certainly the neighbor to the side said they would very much appreciate option two or some version of it. The neighbor to the rear, it, with their comments, since they have already proposed sliding the stairs forward, I'm taking it that they would prefer to not have the stairs so close. And Therefore, it strikes me as sort of, I guess I'll use the word obvious, that some work between the architect and staff to find a way to move those stairs forward without creating that um, balcony or that area that was objectionable um, is a strict as a way that would work for all of the parties. And I think I heard Andrea say, uh, and the architect say, well, but again, I don't want to put words in his mouth, relatively straightforward to accomplish. So my, my um, sentiment is to not support the location of the stairs as they're proposed. And my, uh, my own request would be for staff to work with the architect to slide them forward in a single run, cutting across what is going to be the garage roof in a way that does not create the objectionable balcony, because I think it feels like a win-win-win. Thank you. And I don't see additional commissioner hands raised. So I'm wondering from staff, um, or our attorney, whether there's a path forward that meets our desired criteria of being efficient um, in terms of um, 
of coming up with a, a modified plan. I'll, I'll start and maybe the, the um, staff can chime in. Uh, I, what, what I am, um, one of the issues that I think is some, there's some code compliance issues. So whatever direction you might give us to develop a different design in consultation with the applicant um, would, would need to take that into account. And I, I'm not talking about the ADU law, I'm just talking about building code requirements. Um, I think there is a requirement that there be a landing at a certain point on stairs. The architect or staff can correct me on that, but I think we need to do that. Uh, but there may be a way to have a jog or something like that that would create a, a, a legal landing there that kind of accomplishes your purposes. Uh, I, the one problem that I would foresee is that if if you do that delegation, then we we might be back at square one, and someone might appeal that again. <laughs> because it's still ultimately a staff decision at that point. So if, if, if you, um, if we can't, uh, if, if we can't figure out what um, is a consensus solution, that's like building code compliant tonight, then I think probably better to continue it and get a new design or an alternative design that you can approve and get, get past this. Um, but if there is a way that, that um, you can, you know, if you have an idea what you want, uh, that, that you could just give us clear direction and that could be your decision. Okay. Uh, we can see if the commissioners and the um, interested parties, you know, agree to a continuation type um, solution. Um, Commissioner Garvey? Thank you, Chair Roof. I can uh, support a continuation. I can also um, support option number two. For me, the, the rub comes if moving the utilities becomes lengthy or problematic, then I believe that the current option that staff has put before us tonight is preferable. I agree with Vice Chair Clements that the state law's intent is to allow ATUs to be built efficiently and quickly. And in that spirit, um, you know, I don't want to drag it out because PG&E is taking, you know, six months to approve a utility, a utility relocation. Uh, so that for me would be helpful to know if we continue the item, what is the timing like on that and is it reasonable? Thank you. Staff, could you give us an idea of a, the timing impact of a continuation? Sure. Um, so a, a couple of thoughts I had um, as that was being discussed. The next um, hearing is December 20th. Um, notices have already gone out for that. So if this were continued um, and everyone agreed that that was doable, um, it, the item would need to be continued specifically to that date um, this evening. Um, we could, in the meantime, um, set up a meeting with building and the architect and homeowners um, within the next few days to go over some possible alternatives, see what we can come up with. Um, Greg is right that there are some building code requirements about landings, um, so I'd be more comfortable if we had our building official weighing in on those designs. Um, and I think one thing that also could probably help speed it up is if the Commission were agreeable to seeing, you know, sketches and site plans rather than the formal plans drawn up at the next hearing. Um, that might save some time as well. Uh, the formal plans and structural plans would, of course, be required as part of the permit. Um, but I know the time that it takes to draw those um, and, you know, print them and, and get them all to scale might not be, you know, doable within the next week, week and a half, when we would have to get everything ready. Um, so those will be my suggestions if the architect and owner believe that, um, you know, that time frame would work for them as well. Okay. Um, Greg, can we solicit feedback from the, um, from the appellant and the um, owners and the neighbors um, on this plan that Andrea just laid out? Um, just want to know, you, open you it for have, public comments or can they just talk? Well, <laughs> well you have discretion to continue something, um, uh, you know, but I, mm -hmm. I, and I think it is most appropriate with this type of application 
since there's some building code imp implications and, uh, and and you know some need to to take a look at what the, what could possibly be done to continue it to the next immediately next meeting. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I I so in other words, you don't have to ask permission of the parties to to get a continuance uh, because once you continue it from a public hearing, you've continued the hearing and you don't need to renotice it. That's not really an issue. Um, well, okay. If you Wonderful. Handle it that way. Okay, well, let's see. Commissioners, are we ready to um, make a, a motion to continue? I would entertain a motion. But just okay. as part of the motion, you want to reopen the public hearing so that it's um, reopened for the next for the next uh, hearing or next okay. Uh, meeting. Okay, so I guess I guess I, I need first a motion to reopen the uh, public hearing so part of this topic, and then we can make our specific motion to continue if we want. So agree, Chair. Point of order: Wouldn't we only be reopening the public hearing if we were not going to vote tonight on the merits? So it would be right. one motion to reopen the public hearing and then and, and then continue, um, it, to the next and continue it to exactly. the exactly. Yeah, so that would be one. So I guess that's two motion, two sequential. Mo one motion. It could be in one motion. Okay, one motion. I will uh, move to uh, reopen the public hearing and continue this item to a date certain of December 20th, 2021. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. Are we ready to ask for a roll call? Any objections or considerations before we move to the roll call? Okay, a roll call, please. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Iacoponi? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you everyone for participating in that topic. And I believe we're ready to move on to the next item, which is the public hearing for 2125 Carmelita Drive, APN 049-352-090, app. 2021-00008, Appeal of a Residential Design Review Committee, RDRC, Decision for Design Review Approval for a New Single Family Home of 3,021 Square Feet. Does staff have a presentation for this? We do, thank you. Uh, good evening, Andrea Martisich, Principal Planner. Uh, the item before you this evening is an appeal of the RDRC decision to approve design review for a new residence at 2125 Carmelita Drive. The lot is approximately 5,500 square feet and is zoned RS6 single family residential. It's located along the south side of Carmelita Drive between Pine Avenue and Manor Drive. There's an existing single story residence on site and the applicant had requested approval for demolition of this residence and construction of a new home. The proposed home would have a first floor of about 1,700 square feet and a second floor of about 1,325 square feet. If approved, the total square footage of the proposed residence, including the garage, would be 3,021 square feet. Uh, the project has been through several rounds of review with the city, um, so I'm gonna try to go through a brief uh, history and background of that. Uh, so originally the proposal was submitted uh, for a new residence, as well as the removal of two protected trees, uh, which are shown um, in green on the screen to the right. At the May 17th, 2021 RDRC hearing, uh, a detailed project presentation was given, followed by discussion by the RDRC and applicant and their arborist. At the time, the RDRC had design concerns and continued the project to allow time for the applicant to work on their design recommendations. Next slide. The applicant returned uh, to the RDRC on June 21st um, and 
they uh, did also at that time withdraw their request for the protected tree removal. At the meeting, the committee members uh, requested further design modifications and continued the item again. The applicant uh, decided at that time not to make any further design modifications to the proposed new house as they did not believe that further revisions would be beneficial. And therefore, at the July 19th, uh, 2021 hearing, the RDRC denied the project by a two to one vote. And the reason and findings for denial were uh, largely based on finding D of the design review criteria. And I'll go ahead and go over that uh, in some upcoming slides. Afterwards, uh, after that denial, TJ Holmes, the applicant, appealed the application to the Planning Commission uh, for review. The Planning Commission heard the item um, and a motion to uh, approved the appeal failed. And so in effect, the appeal itself um, was denied. In response, the applicant appealed this denial uh, to the city council. Next slide. After the appeal application was made to the council, uh, the applicants decided that uh, they would like to try to do some redesign to the residents in order to address some of the concerns of the RDRC. This new design, um, and this is the one that will be before you this evening, was approved by the RDRC. As a result, Thomas James Holmes withdrew their appeal uh, for the original application that was scheduled to be heard before council. So this design that was approved by the RDRC was approved by a 2-0 vote. And uh, the RDRC found that with the design changes, uh, all of the findings and specifically finding D could be met. Subsequently, the neighbors of the proposed residents uh, appealed this RDRC approval, and this appeal is what is before you this evening. Uh, so just to clarify in terms of the action uh, taken this evening, uh, the Planning Commission, if the Planning Commission chooses to deny the appeal, that would in effect uh, uphold the RDRC decision and approve the House. If the Planning Commission approves the appeal, then the RDRC decision would be overturned and uh, the approval for the house would be, or I'm sorry, the house uh, design would be denied. Next slide. Uh, so just a refresher about the, the site. Uh, again, it's approximately 5,500 square feet. Um, this shows a view of the house looking uh, towards the east. Next slide. This is the proposed site plan, uh, and just to orient you, Carmelita is at the, the bottom part of the screen. Um, in terms of the building footprint itself, the lower level footprint is the gray outline, uh, and the upper floor footprint is the hatched area. You can see uh, four circles on the screen. The three green circles represent existing trees that are protected, that are proposed to remain. And the red tree, uh, I'm sorry, the red circle uh, represents a black walnut tree located at the front of the lot that is now proposed for removal. Uh, however, this is not a protected tree and so does not require a permit. However, this has changed from the original approval. So I did want to point it out for you. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the floor plan, uh, Sorry, this is, yes, the first floor. Uh, the first floor shows the one car garage on the left side of the screen. Um, and what on the first floor is a great room, kitchen and dining room, as well as one of the bedrooms and a bathroom. Next slide. Uh, the second floor I wanted to point out uh, has about the same square footage as the previous design. Uh, the significant change that occurred from the last uh, version of this that the, the Planning Commission reviewed was that uh, the quote unquote courtyard area um, that is on the uh, upper floor before has now been filled in. So square footage from the rear of the second floor has been um, brought in to fill in the, the area that was cut out at the middle of the house. Um, and that has resulted in about a six foot reduction in the depth of the second floor. And I'll go ahead and show that more clearly on the elevation in some up, on, on the elevations in some upcoming slides. Next slide, please. This is the front elevation. The proposed residence is designed in a traditional farmhouse and craftsman style um, with the use of high quality materials, including a combination of board and batten and horizontal wood siding. 
There's also, as you can see, traditional window trims as well as gable and shed roofs. Um, one of the previous concerns uh, that came up with the design was the proportion of uh, the residents in terms of the second floor proportion to the first floor. Uh, so to address this, the applicants added a roof between the first and second floor along the right side of the house, or I'm sorry, along the right front of the residence, um, and also removed some transom windows. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see uh, renderings of what was before the planning commission previously and what is before the commission now. Um, so you'll see on the left side, that was the uh, previous proposal that uh, was denied by the Planning Commission and RDRC. And uh, what's before you this evening is on the right. So uh, again, to reiterate, you can see on the second floor, the transom windows above the, um, the four windows in the front have been removed. Um, the overall height of the gables have come down and the roof was added below the gable on the right uh, to better provide uh, proportion between the two stories. That roof in effect created a porch along the front right side. Um, so that is also uh, another significant change uh, for the front front view of the residence. Next slide, please. In terms of the elevations, um, the applicants are proposing to, uh, for the most part, provide either five foot or six foot sill heights for the windows. Um, for privacy reasons, um, this was something that uh, they proposed earlier on in the, the in the project and they are carrying through. Next slide. Um, for each of the elevations, I'll show the proposed elevation as well as um, a subsequent slide with the comparison. Um, and so uh, on the current proposals, I uh, clouded the areas that, that are the, the most significant changes. Um, so on this slide, you can see that the rear portion of the second floor has been brought in several feet, um, and that is a result of being able to utilize uh, area that was previously open on the second floor. Um, so bringing in that rear setback, which um, in effect changed the roof line at the rear. Uh, you can also see at the front of the residence that that front porch is bumped out um, more than the, than the previous proposal. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, right elevation. Um, again, you'll see the six foot uh, sill heights for the window. And if you can uh, go to the next slide, I'll show the comparison between the two versions. Uh, so this is really where a, a significant amount of change happened on the second floor. Uh, on the left side, you'll see where the house stepped in quite a bit, uh, where those three windows are in the middle. That has now built, been completely filled in um, with, with the floor area. Um, which again uh, has allowed the house to bump in at the rear. Um, you'll also see the side view of that front porch um, and added roof line under the uh, second floor gable uh, on the, the um, right side. You'll also see um, at the second floor that there's one continuous roof line now um, rather than it being broken up as before for the various massing um, portions. Next slide. Uh, from the rear, uh, there's uh, there's two large trees back here again, both of which are uh, proposed to remain. Um, they are protected trees. Uh, and the next slide will show uh, the change in um, design. So you can see that the um, gable was made wider at the rear um, now that the square footage has been pulled in a bit. Um, but beyond that, not too many significant changes from, from the rear view. Next slide. Uh, again, wanted to just show the different um, views from the previous submittal and current submittal. Uh, most significantly on the bottom two pictures, you can see along the right side uh, where that courtyard area was on the second floor, um, now being completely filled in um, as shown on the right side. Next slide. Sorry, let me just catch up to my colors and materials. Um, so in terms of the, the materials, uh, I mentioned that board and batten are proposed. Um, the, the color would be painted uh, Sher Sherwin-Williams foggy day, and the front door trim and gutters would be um, white. Uh, and then the roof is proposed to be shingles uh, in a charcoal color. Next slide. And again, this is uh, just a larger view of the rendering shown on, on the previous screen. Next slide. Uh, the applicant is proposing new landscaping in all of the yards 
um, as well as a variety of plant shrubs and, and ground cover. Um, there are eight new 15 gallon trees proposed uh, along the east and west side of the yard. Again, uh, the three protected trees are proposed to remain and the red circle represents uh, the black walnut tree proposed for removal. Next slide. In terms of public comment uh, for this specific application, uh, the city mailed the uh, notice to property owners within a 300 foot uh, radius of the project site, as well as published it in the newspaper. Uh, staff received several public comments, um, all of which have been included within the staff report. Uh, there were seven neighbors uh, with concerns. However, this does not include uh, the four appellants. So um, their, their comment letters were um, shown separately in the packet from, from neighbors who were not appellants. And again, um, the main concerns regarded size and compatibility with the neighborhood. Um, I will be, when, I come, when I'm done, uh, the appellant has a presentation as well. So they will be going more into depth about um, their concerns with the project as well as um, compatibility. Next slide, please. Uh, I just included a few pictures in case uh, we need them for discussion. Um, so this is looking down Carmelita um, towards Alameda de las Pulgas. Um, and then the next uh, slide shows basically looking towards the house up towards Manor from uh, Alameda. If you could advance the slide, please. Uh, the these slides show uh, 2121 uh, or sorry 2125 Carmelita in relation to the existing homes that are there now, and so the red arrows uh, indicate where the home would be located. Next slide. Uh, so for any design review approval, uh, five findings need to be met. Um, several of these have to do with compliance with the general plan as well as uh, compliance with development standards. And the staff report uh, outlines how these findings have been met. Uh, but I did want to focus on the design review criteria. Uh, within the design review criteria are several um, standards that need to be considered. And uh, this is really the crux of, of um, the appeal and, and the concerns that have come up. Um, so I'm going to focus on two of them that are specific to the design of the project. Uh, and the first of those is design review criteria A. Um, and Lisa, if, if you want to click on the links, I'm not sure if we need to, but the, the, they're linked in the slide if we need to look at them now or later. Um, but the first uh, criteria is uh, that the project including scale, massing, site plan, uh, design, and landscaping will enhance the appearance and features of the project site. And so staff believe this finding was met um, because it is designed to meet setback requirements. Uh, it has articulated massing. And the style itself, the farmhouse craftsman style, um, is compatible with the neighborhood, which includes a mix of one and two story homes, as well as a variety of architectural styles. Uh, the development incorporates traditional roof lines and step backs. Uh, and in addition, um, the materials themselves are similar to exterior materials uh, found throughout the neighborhood. Uh, design review criteria D is the one that um, has been referenced the most. And that, that criteria really focuses on the project being compatible with neighboring development, avoiding big differences in building scale and character, um, and, and allowing for harmonious transition. And so staff found uh, that the neighborhood, that it did meet this finding because of a mix of single story and two story homes. The height um, met, the height was similar to other two story homes in the neighborhood, although there are not two story homes immediately on either side. Um, and it is larger than some homes in the neighborhood. The size is similar to other two-story homes. And it would also be similar in size to any new construction that, that exercises the same development standards under the RS6 zoning district. The depth of the house at the second floor has been reduced at the rear, and the porch at the front has brought the house more in line with the house on the right. Um, and again, I know that the appellants will be talking about this more in their presentation, um, but I did just want to give a um, brief overview first. Next slide, please. So um, staff is recommending a suggested order this evening, um, if okay with the chair. And uh, that is that after staff concludes their presentation, um, there would be a presentation by the appellant team. 
Uh, and then the PC Planning Commission could ask clarifying questions for um, staff or the appellant um, or RDRC members. We do have um, Ellen Garvey, of course, who's our Planning Commissioner, also Chair of the RDRC um, here this evening, as well as Eugene Sakai, who is an architect um, on the RDRC. So both of them are available um, for questions on, on their vote and, um, and experience at the RDRC meeting. Uh, and then we would suggest to open public comment um, but start that that public comment with Thomas James Holmes team, um, who's the the developer for the site, and then um, of course open it for additional uh, members of the public. Next slide. So with that, I'm available for any questions. Um, I have put on the screen uh, the appellant team um, order that they'll be presenting just to help guide us through um, their presentation. Um, so with that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Well, are there any burning questions or can we just move to the appellant team presentation before opening for our clarifying question session? Okay, no burning questions. So let's uh, move to the appellant team presentation. And, and yes, Andrea, I, I agree with the, uh, the order of, um, of how we'll process this. And uh, I saw that earlier, looks great. So appellant team, welcome. I guess we need to get your introductions and presentation up. I think we're waiting for Michael Quigley. Michael Quigley, are you? Am I here? You are. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, read an introduction uh, for my team members that will present this evening, and then I will uh, present some slides at the end of that. Uh, wish to uh, wish the Planning Commission members and the representatives of Thomas James Holmes a very good evening and uh, to all the other parties that are in attendance as we open our appeal to overturn the November 1st, 2021 Residential Design Review Committee approval for a new two-storey home at 2125 Carmelita Drive. Our appeal comes more than a year after the neighbours of Carmelita Drive were invited by Thomas James Holmes to hear a presentation regarding their proposed project and participate in discussion as to the ultimate finalizing of plans pertaining to neighborhood compatibility for that project. As you will hear tonight, that process has not gone smoothly for adjoining and other affected neighbors. A recurring theme will carry our appeal as presenters draw attention to unfair scale and massing of the project, especially as it pertains to criteria D. A continuing and urgent cry for fair play will ring out as we defend our spaces between our homes from being targeted for what we see as unfair development. A development that with application of compassion for neighbors and a creative design process could eventually proceed. Team speakers, Josh Safran, Tom Hoskin and Matt Grocott will present opening comments for your consideration and will be followed by other long serving supporters of our appeal at the appropriate time during tonight's meeting. Thank you very much. And at this time, I would like to uh, yield the floor to Joshua Safran. Thanks, Michael. Good evening, everyone. And as always, thanks to the commission and all the city representatives for your time that you so graciously give us and for your commitment to the greater good. I've submitted my written comments regarding the need to uphold our appeal. Uh, an appeal that's been filed by us, the residents of Carmelita, and I'd just like to quickly summarize those comments here. Uh, we're exhausted. Look at the amount of effort that Michael Quigley has put into this, and you'll see that when you'll see pictures of his painstakingly made hand-built models that show clearly the relative size of this house compared to the two adjacent. The bulk of the house will be visible to everyone who drives up Carmelita from Alameda de las Pulgas, thanks to the curve and the bulb out in the street. And I encourage anyone to look at the side of the proposed dwelling as you drive up Carmelita. This will affect everyone, not just the adjacent neighbors. We're respectfully asking for two things from Thomas James Holmes. We're asking for compromise and we're asking for fairness. We live here. We've invested in these homes. They're a place to live. Profit 
is and always will be secondary to us here who purchase these properties to live in. We implore you, Thomas James Homes and the city to support us. Please show some compassion for the families that live on this block. Simply reduce the rear bulk of the house so that it fits into the neighborhood and protects the well-being of the residents, most notably Michael Quigley, Mrs. Quigley, and Ms. Henry, who's on the other side. Yes, you did modify the previous design, but you kept the same square footage. So now the sides of the house are huge flat surfaces to make up for that. So you really didn't give anything up there. The floor area ratio remains the same. So I'm asking the commissioners to please compel this builder to build a house that's in keeping with the neighborhood. That's what we did. That's what the Saeces did up the street. That's what the Burtons did next door. In fact, the only house on this block that maximized its floor area ratio at the expense of all the other neighbors was the house that's next door to Mr. Houskin that was built by a contractor who immediately sold his multi-year residence, took the profit, and retired to another part of the state. Eventually, a house is going to be built at 2125 Carmelita. And TJ Homes will move on to its next project and hopefully will be increasingly successful as they achieve what I think everybody wants is a successful IPO. But we'll be here forever. The proposed home at 2125 Carmelita as it stands today is exactly why criteria D exists in the code. Please protect your citizens. Please enforce criteria D. It's a small, irregularly shaped lot. Thank you. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Tom Hoskin, and if you could queue up the slides, I'll wait a moment while they get, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so I'm a resident on the street, and uh, I we appeared to you before. This is the sixth hearing in San Carlos, the second one before the Planning Commission. So. Thanks to you all for your patience uh, and to the city staff as well, who's done a lot of work on this. Um, and there's a lot of documentation in the uh, agenda packet. I trust that you've been through it. There's a lot of material there. I know it's very tedious, uh, but I'm going to kind of refer more, more to that and keep my comments relatively short. <clears throat> so first of all, what you see here is uh, Carmelita Drive. Welcome to Carmelita and a couple of these photos already showed up before. There's actually a lot more of them in the agenda packet starting on page 111, which shows kind of the character of the street with a lot of very low scale housing. So yeah, there are some larger scale houses, but they uh, tend to blend in with the neighborhood very well, very nicely. And so I try to put some of those in there just to give you an idea of what the character of the street looks like. Now on the upper left hand corner, that is uh, Mr. Quigley's house. And on the right of that, that the White House is the house that's currently there. That's where the proposed construction would go. On the right, uh, upper right hand side is the house on the other side of the construction. Um, and then in the, at the bottom would be in front of the house at 2125 looking up the street. <clears throat> Excuse me. By the way, in back, uh, you can't really see it. It's uh, surprisingly difficult to see in these shots, but in the upper left hand uh, view, there is a redwood tree. There are two redwood trees actually. One of them was proposed for removal due to so-called safety reasons uh, back in May before the original, before the very first RDRC meeting. But after 35 letters that were submitted to the RDRC and three arborists, one contracted by uh, Thomas James Holmes, one by the city and one by the neighbors, um, Actually, the Thomas James Holmes decided to withdraw its uh, request to remove that tree, and uh, that relieved one of the major early concerns over the house. Um, but meanwhile, there hasn't been a lot of changes to the design. So if you could advance the slide, please. So uh, the floor area really hasn't changed. So the top line says the proposal that's currently on appeal to the city council. Actually, I understand that's been withdrawn, but that was the original proposal that you ruled on uh, back in September, I think it was, and the floor area ratio that went with that. The proposal that's currently before you is in the middle line. Notice that it's actually technically three square feet larger than the floor area before. 
and just hitting the the very very within a square foot of what the legal limit is for the floor area ratio for the floor area so they're really pushing it right to that limit and that's of course they can do that with regard to that particular rule but I maintain that you can't get that kind of floor area and what they're really trying to do of course is maximize the the value of the house at $1,100 per square foot you can't get that floor area on the on the lot size on the pot pie shaped lot size without violating criteria D so you can't have it all right and they're going for the floor area which is part of their business plan that's that's what they do so if you could advance the slide please this just drills down a little bit more into this just to show you the first floor plan is exactly the same as the original second floor the garage is exactly the same so the second floor plan actually increased so if you think that the second floor changed at all and Andrea Martisich mentioned this the second floor didn't really change in fact it increased by a couple square feet they shaved off a little bit off the back and then filled in the courtyard area but it's still a very massive house on a small pie shaped lot doesn't fit into the neighborhood so advance a lot to the last slide please so I just want to remind the Planning Commission again to that the City Council San Carlos City Council revised the zoning rules in 2018 this is a two-year process that started in 2016 with a good girl San Carlos citizens effort and I we have somebody here tonight that will speak about that there was a task force there was a consultant that was brought in there were town hall meetings they went to the Planning Commission and then I believe it was November 2018 that the City Council passed the rules directly to address this issue of oversized homes in San Carlos now the revision is no good if it's not enforced and there's a number of criteria that go into the zoning rules and one of them is criteria D and if there's ever an example where criteria D is relevant it's this one so I'm requesting that you please give it your full consideration I presume that you've been to the neighborhood you looked at the materials and deny the proposed design uphold the appeal and based on criteria D thank you next is Matt Matt Drocott Matt you're muted are you there Matt there we go I unmuted can you hear me yes okay very good thanks for Michael I want to thank you for inviting me just so the commissioners understand a little bit of backstory I designed a remodel in addition across the street from Michael's home for the owners at that time were the Mercati's and right next door to them eventually was built a two-story monstrosity that I think was mentioned earlier by someone else already tonight that was built by a contractor he sold it and moved away under the auspices of he was going to live there but because I did that the Mercati's I met Michael he came and asked if I would consider designing a small addition to his house which he never did do but that was the introduction that we had and when this project came up he reached out to me and asked for for some advice and for some help I wanted to start by saying this when I was on the City Council one of the policies I followed and encouraged my fellow council members to follow as well not that they necessarily did but I tried to encourage it related to the city's growth I felt it was important to respect our current citizens who had moved to San Carlos with certain expectations of what the city would be like for many years to come everyone expects growth and change to take place in an urban environment but it should not be so quick and major as to overwhelm those who already call San Carlos home when someone chooses a particular city to lay down their roots there are usually several factors at play certainly two are the city's size and character 
when deciding upon a particular neighborhood or street, these factors become even more focused. Questions which one considers are what are the sizes of the, how, of the homes? How densely arranged are they? Are most single story or two story? Is there adequate parking or do most people park on the street and add to the feeling of being congested? And on that point, I can tell you when uh, many years ago when I was looking to, to buy my first home and ended up purchasing in San Carlos, that last point is the reason I didn't purchase in Belmont because in Belmont, there's a lot of parking on the streets in, in a lot of those neighborhoods. These questions carry great importance, especially when purchasing a home. Buying a home for most people is a major investment. It is financially a major investment, and it is with one's own life as well. For most people, it is where they intend to stay for decades into the future. It is where they plan to raise their family, build a career, and in their latter years, live out their retirement. That would be the case for Mr. Quigley and his wife and uh, his neighbor on the other side of this particular property. I know with the younger generations, the idea of living in one place for too long a time may seem boring, but for the folks I know who are older, people I still speak to in San Carlos uh, when, I, when I come into town, the idea of moving from a community where they have lived for three, four, maybe even five or six decades is not something they want to contemplate, let alone do. To move away means finding new friends, new social outlets, a new doctor, dentist. Ultimately, it means becoming familiar with an entirely new community. Of course, selling a home in a city like San Carlos can bring hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit if one bought decades ago. However, some things in life don't carry a price tag. Feeling comfortable in your home and community where you have lived for many years is one of those things. It's what we call priceless. At this meeting, commissioners, you have an appeal before you where the issue is a proposed project by TJ Homes. Develop, the developer has bought a pie-shaped lot on Carmelita where stood a small bungalow or still stands a small bungalow between two other modest homes of similar size and design. Their intent was to demolish the existing home and construct a two-story structure in its place. The total square footage, this is an important point, the total square footage of the proposed structure would dwarf the combined square footages of the two adjoining neighbors. In other words, if you added together the square footage of the adjoining neighbors on either side, that square footage of those two homes would be less than the combined square footage of what is proposed with those two stories. Of course, we know and understand why the developer wishes to build a structure of the size they propose. Never mind, most of the neighboring homes are acutely modest by comparison. The reason is they wish to maximize their profit. Ironic, isn't it? For the neighbors on either side, there is no price great enough to entice them to move, while on the other hand, for the developer, no price is too great. Well, Thomas James Homes cannot be prevented from doing business in San Carlos, but what they can be prevented from doing is damaging the character of the neighborhoods where they propose to demolish existing homes and construct new ones. And notice I didn't, in that sentence, just target this one project because TJ Holmes has a reputation of doing this in other places in San Carlos and in other cities on the peninsula. It's their business plan. In short, the practice of their business model should not come at the expense of folks like Mr. and Mrs. Quigley or their neighbor, Ms. Jeannie Henry. It should not come at the expense of these people enjoying their retirement years in their homes as they have always expected to do. Fortunately, commissioners, you are given criteria other than hard line factors, such as height limit, lot coverage, yard setbacks, by which you may base your decision tonight. You may also consider whether or not the proposed structure is a contextual fit for the street 
based upon the other existing homes in the neighborhood, and most importantly, those homes immediately adjacent. If you uphold the, the appeal, I would expect the developer to go back to the drawing board and design a structure to fit more appropriately on the pie-shaped lot which is to be upon which it is to be built. With the current design, the proposed structure may not look imposing from the street, but an element which stands out glaringly is an exception in the zoning code of which the developer took advantage. The exception allows one to calculate the overall length of a ground level sidewall, multiply the figure by 30% and apply the result to an upper story wall length, which impinges up to four feet into the normal sec story, second story setback. This exception has been applied to the rear half of the structure as the lot narrows. From the perspective of the neighboring properties, it makes for a tight fit. The, ap the application of the exception may follow the code, but at the same time on a lot which narrows towards the rear, it makes for an imposing structure relative to the neighbors. In my professional opinion, the design as proposed does not fit the criteria of being a contextual fit for the neighborhood. I hope, commissioners, you will arrive at the same conclusion and act in favor of the appellants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Do I uh, speak again uh, now, Chair? Yes, I believe um, you get a few more minutes and then um, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Chair Ruth. Um, thank you very much uh, to my fellow presenters there. And uh, as you can hear, uh, Commission members, that we are not protesting the right of a developer to, to build a home. Uh, we're protesting the right of a, a builder to infringe upon our common rights as human beings and homeowners. I would like to ask uh, the uh, uh, Andrea or whoever's going to do it to bring up my first slide of a little model that I, I built. And I am, <laughs> I'm not able to use CAD CAM and create all the uh, exotic uh, pictures from a, a computer program, but I, I spent five days building this model and I did my very, very best to be as accurate as possible. Uh, you can see the little lines at the side of the central house they represent the fence lines. And of course, the little Christmas trees are the big redwoods at the back. My house is on the left as you look at the picture and Jenny's is on the right. Uh, you can see already what Matt was uh, addressing is that this is easily more than double the size of the two houses conjoined. If we could go to slide two, please. This is a view positioned in Jenny Henry's backyard. Now, there's been discussions about the view of the houses from the street, there, and we know there are two-story houses in Carmelita Drive, but the issue is not from the front of the street. We have no real objection to a two-story home. Our objection is what you're looking at here. That scaled stick figure is a five-foot-tall stick figure. Now, I chose five feet. My wife's not much over five feet. I'm 5'10". We have other visitors that uh, would be in similar uh, yeah, you know, height ranges, what have you. We have taller people as well. But you can imagine sitting in Jenny's backyard now where she currently enjoys blue sky and, and, and plants and what have you, and all she's going to see is that giant structure. This is very concerning. We go to slide three, please. Simply the same view encompassing the entirety of the back of Jenny's house, and you can see once again how that structure is dwarfing her backyard and her living environment. Slide four. Once again, a more aggressive look. You can imagine entertaining your friends in the backyard, having a barbecue, and they're being very friendly with you, but they're all probably looking at that building saying, how, much, how can they live next to this? How can they stand having that next to them? Slide five, please. And this is a view from my backyard. It's more of the same, but we're going to suffer the same issues. Uh, I'm going to be uh, looking at that structure, whereas now I'm, I'm enjoying you know, trees and, and blue sky and what have you. And the fact that they're talking about planting screening trees, 
let's face it, if you try to plant a screening tree between the fence and that structure, it's not going to get the sunlight it needs. It's not going to, to flourish. It's not going to work. We're going to live with that wall for the rest of the time that we live in San Carlos. Uh, next slide, please. Once again, a similar view. It's talking to the mass and scale and bulk and aggressively overpowering structure that we're going to be facing. Next slide. Once again, the same sort of view. And then to the final slide, which is the most important one as far as I'm concerned, because it, it, it talks to a suggestion that was made by Mr. Sakai in the early RDRC meetings. And I have to mention that I was being a bit of a naysayer about what I was to expect from the, the government uh, representatives in this issue, but I have been overwhelmingly encouraged by the performance of the RDRC and the Commission in their abilities to be fair to both parties, and I've taken great solace in that. But there was a recommendation made by Mr Sakai very early that the structure be pulled back to extend no further than the rear corners of each of the adjoining homes. And that white line represents on my model as close as I can potentially get it uh, to what he was recommending. I'm sure you would agree that would still offer a large spacious home for anybody that purchased it. It would still give a reasonable backyard and it would no longer encroach on our living environment. It would be very representative of one of our speakers tonight, Mr. David Saisi, who worked with neighbours to build a two-storey home, increase the size of their house to two storeys, and did not extend back past the side of the, the rear of Ginny's home. He lives to the right of her. And that's what neighbours do for each other. Mr. Sakai has given very much good advice to the, the builder as to how to act in a, in a, in a, a neighbourly fashion. And I know that they have the right to, to maximise their investments. Uh, I support private industry, no problem. But there is a limit where criteria D has to stand and say what they're proposing is just not fair. Mr. Bradley, in earlier RDRC meetings when he was the chair, uh, mentioned the codes. He talked about how there has to be a code. There has to be something for us to draw upon to be able to say, yes, this is what we can build. However, when it comes to pie-shaped lots and this particular project, he showed great empathy to the neighbours that we, as we were objecting and said he didn't understand how we had arrived at this place, referring to the codes to where they had to be applied to all lots that didn't necessarily fit with them. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, this is a, a, a pivotal moment in the time for San Carlos and development. Thomas James Homes are a professional operation. They have the right to do business. They're not fools, but I'm sure that they have realized this little 2125 Carmelita lot and this battle that they're having with neighbors is one they must win because it will set a precedent. And if that precedent is set, the difficulty that the city may have in the future for controlling the face of San Carlos as it develops may be very much hindered because each time a developer, whether it be Thomas James Homes or someone else, each time they present a giant home to be put on maybe an unacceptable lot, it'll be very difficult to deny because they'll be able to say, oh, look what happened at 2125. Criteria D was assaulted. It doesn't really count anymore. You've got to approve this one as well. So I'm sure the commissioners understand that. I'm not trying to tell anybody their job, but uh, it's a situation also where I feel that in the United States, it's a majority of rule when people vote. And at the moment, we've got a majority of neighbours objecting to this uh, project. We have a single entity, which is a business, as the only ones supporting it. I do appreciate the time of the commission. I appreciate the time that's been put in by all of our supporters on Carmelita and further afield. And I, I implore the, uh, the commission to please uphold our appeal. We feel it is just, we feel it has merit, and it is not a, a, an appeal against the, the RDRC. I feel that the vote that they took last time was something of almost a backed into a corner situation. They had to do something of that nature, but it was made clear to us that we had the right of appeal 
And that's what we were doing, hoping with your extra power and extra knowledge that you can help us in this situation as we go forward and try to live our lives on Carmelita. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. So now the order of our um, discussion will, uh, we can have a few minutes for clarifying questions from the Planning Commission, then we'll open for public comment. And this is where Thomas James Holmes will uh, provide some input. So I, I um, encourage the Planning Commissioners to kind of hold most of the discussion until after we've got more of the story on the table. But if there are any uh, clarifying questions uh, of the um, uh, appellants, now is the time we can ask. I'm looking for raised hands. I don't see any yet, but I'm, I bet one will come. Maybe while the other commissioners are thinking, I'll ask one of, um, of Michael Quigley, which the, the figure you showed with the white line drawn on it that would um, bring the rear of the house back, would you envision the reduction to be the second story part of the structure only? Uh, no, sir. I'm I'm envisaging the entire back of the house coming back, and the reason that I'm I'm doing that is when I look at Mr. Saizi's home, uh, which is to the uh, to the right of Jenny Henry's home. As you look at it, he's got a beautiful. I think I think he told me it's to be the 2,700 square feet or 2,900 square feet with the garage or something like that, uh, and it does not extend back past the back of Jenny's house. Uh, he communicated with her and the opposing side-by-side -side neighbor. Uh, and I, I believe, and we've, we've talked about it, he left a bit of money on the table by, by doing so, but he did the right thing by neighbors. So if you look at that white line, that's a straight chop straight down. Uh, obviously, there'd be a little bit of flexibility as far as myself concerned if there was a, you know, this little extension out here was a, a sitting area or what have you. But the major bulk of the house would then be in line with those two rear corners. When I walk into my backyard, yes, I would see the house, but I wouldn't be staring flat up against the walls and being overpowered by the structure. And okay. I would still have you know, privacy and, 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 and a nice living area in my rear because that's where the entire argument here is what's happening at the back of this house. Indeed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Clarifying questions from the planning commissioners before we open for public comment. Seeing none, I, um, I would entertain a motion to open the public comment period. I'll move we open public comment. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Iacoponi? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. So as I said, we'll open public comment and uh, have the Thomas James Holmes representatives um, come first. Uh, due to the situation, I think they'll, uh, we'll, I'll allow them to have more than just the two minutes. Uh, but, um, but please, let's not uh, review um, the entire history that's already been before the Planning Commission. Take it away. Hi, I'm Anna Salver. I'm the planning manager for Thomas James Homes, and I'm going to bring up this. Am I able to share my screen? Let's see. All right. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can see that. Great. So, like you said, I won't iterate reiterate everything. But where we're at right now, last time I was before you at Planning Commission, um, it was, uh, we did file an appeal on the denial of the project at RDRC um, due to some outstanding items, which was criteria D, um, neighborhood compatibility and matching the scale of the home. And we did work with staff to address those and work with the committee to get approval of this project. So that is what is here um, before you today. Um, and I'd like to hit some key points about uh, the significant changes that were done in order to achieve that approval. Uh, bringing up a slide that was previously brought up in a, another planning commission is the, the broader context around our home, which is highlighted in gray. Um, there are a, a mix of 
first story and second story homes. The highlighted homes are the two story homes in the neighborhood. And there are a mix, um, a variety of square footages. The one right across the street being 2950 livable square feet where we are at 2729 square feet. So, um, and then behind us 3140 and 2941. So we are, uh, we aren't exceeding a pattern that is already existing in this neighborhood and the evolution that's already begun along the street. And of course, another previous slide showing the massing and scale of those two story homes um, that are along that street, as well as the one story homes that were presented by the neighbors, as well as uh, principal planner and the square footages to go with them. Um, the three requests that were really brought up in the last planning commission, as well as from R the last RDRC um, when we had received denial was we need to look at reducing the massing at the second floor from the rear reducing the massing at the second floor seen from the street and then filling in that courtyard space at the second floor. We had previously filled in the courtyard at the first floor. That was for us to be able to accommodate the, the redwood tree in the back um, so that it wasn't a safety issue anymore. And it took some redesign to do that. But we, we took another look at this um, with help and uh, were able to come up with another proposed design that was approved at the RDRC meeting. Uh, the yellow is the required setback and our dark gray is our second story and the light gray is our first story. As you can see, we do have quite a bit of setback now from that first story um, with that second story being pushed back. This would be about six foot 10 inches, which is quite significant um, from the previous plan. And then these lines coming across showing the outer edges of the homes, though I know there was a white line that was drawn here, though it it looked like it was drawn through the middle of our plan. It's actually um, quite further out to so the scale of that model, though very impressive, um, <laughs> is, is, is slightly off. Um, so I wanted to make sure we, we looked at that. And then of course the front, we're showing more gray uh, first story element here in the front, um, which helps with uh, what we're seeing from that front elevation as expressed before. Um, quickly looking at the floor plan, which you've already seen before, an elongated porch allows us to get that first story element. The second story, uh, we redesigned <laughs> most of the second story. It lives quite differently. It's, it's a very different plan, but we were able to fill in this um, courtyard and it, it took a lot of redesign work to get that six foot 10 to pull back that second story. We do have constraints with stairs and garages and, and all these setbacks that we're working with in the code. So um, we do, we are aware of all those items and we are, um, creating a significant setback with, with, um, to address the neighborhood compatibility and that reduction. This is just the comparison, which you've seen before the previous bill on the right and the approved recently approved on the left. And that length, as you can see, is quite different than what's on the right, um, that previous courtyard or recess in there. The comparison you've already seen here, that first story elongated porch helps um, reduce the verticality of that gable, taking out those transoms, but also reducing and lowering these gables to, to reduce the verticality as seen from the street, which is something extra that we wanted to make sure we could do as we're taking another look around on this plan and anywhere we could minimize verticality, we did. Uh, we also removed transoms in the back and reduced um, with a new roof layout on this plan, we were able to reduce that height in the back too. So now you're seeing a lower pitch at the sides as it grows towards that middle ridge. And this is the side view of it. Again, no courtyard as previously um, uh, proposed. We, we are filling that in. Maintaining all the high windows is really important as that was expressed by the neighbors. We want to make sure we can maintain that all the way across both edges. Uh, the two Ds. The previous is below. The approved is above, um, showing that relief back here um, is, is much significant from the previous plan. And then again, the difference in the roof layout does help as this provides relief and more um, natural light to come down with a, a lower pitch at the edge here. Uh, and then of course, these high windows. Same with the rear and the left-hand side, as you've seen before. This is a new slide I wanted to show, as I know it's been brought up about this irregular lot, high shape. Uh, what does that mean for setbacks? How can we um, not max out to the setbacks? And I want to show that uh, the yellow is the required as previously shown, but the green is our additional setbacks with this first story that's grayed out here. 
um, we are almost doubling that rear setback. Um, and then we're also providing additional setback as highlighted in green along the edges and at the front. And then same with our second story. This is almost trip. Now that we've reduced the second story six foot 10 inches, we've about tripled that rear setback now. Um, and then still being able to provide additional setbacks along the edges and the front. Provides even articulation. Most of the buildings that we're seeing um, on the previous slide um, up at the, the beginning of the neighbor context, a lot of the homes, because of their um, boxy shape of the lot, go right up to the setback line and just a straight shot all the way down, whereas we're able to provide articulation because of the, the pie shaped lot. We did a solar study uh, <laughs> just to kind of, I'm going to try to zoom in here, but um, and move around a little bit so you can see better. But this is showing the massing of these three homes that have been brought up by um, the neighbors as well. So we are looking with north at the top of the page, and um, we're looking at the, the rear yards of the three homes, existing homes, uh, Michael Quigley's home, Ginny's home, and then the existing home that's on 2125 Carmelita. And then the left would be showing our proposed condition. There are shadows being shown with the trees and the home. And we've looked at the summer and winter solstices. Um, this one is the summer and most of the day we have um, very little impact of shadowing on the neighboring lot. Um, as you can see with these first story homes, the side yards are usually shadowed. Same with the proposed home. The side yard is pretty much shadowed um, at the 9 a.m. time. Noon, of course, that direct sun from above, not gonna give you much shadow. Um, but as we progress to the 3 p.m. time, um, it's just, it moves over to the other side lot. There is a little bit of overage on the neighboring lot, but for the most part, it stays pretty much the same as these existing homes um, are showing that they shadow that side lot. The trees also shadow quite a bit. Those redwoods are pretty tall, so they will be shadowing the neighboring um, lot, and we have shown that. Uh, 6 p.m., close to dark, of course, you're going to get those really long shadows. So at that time before, the sunset, you will get some, some nice long shadows here that would shadow the neighboring lots. As you can see, the existing condition here, our proposed lot does um, shadow a little bit more um, to the, the adjacent neighbor, but again, is not the majority of the day. The winter solstice uh, does have really long shadows throughout the day, but it mainly hits uh, the street side. So you're gonna see at 9 a.m., um, at the existing at least, is basically shadowing the street. We've got the blue that shows additional shadowing of the street. Um, nothing really impacts, it does hit the side lot, but nothing that would really impact more so than what's already existing. And then the noon, of course, would only give you a small shadow at their front lot and their front setbacks. 3 p.m. showing those long shadows, they just shift over to the other side. So they still are in the street and on the side yards. Um, this is the, the existing home shadows. And again, that yellow showing the existing and that additional blue at the top there. And then of course at 6 p.m. in the winter, no shadowing um, as it is dark. So I wanted to show that out there just because I know that that would, was an impact that's been brought up and wanted to show that the second story because of the reduction, because of the layout of it, um, that it would be a light impact um, if no impact to the yard that is back here um, and more so of an impact to shadowing the street as, as existing. We went over the trees and our additional trees are in green and the trees that we're protecting and saving that are heritage are in yellow. So I won't go too far into that. I did wanna um, end on um, just design process and the history of this project. I know everyone's put a lot of effort into this um, and everyone has a, a, a certain view and perspective of, of design criteria D, but starting with October, 2020 of a transitional <laughs> elevation that was not really well received um, as the neighborhood is quite traditional. So our evolution of that, as well as looking at um, filling in the courtyard, there's been a lot of changes internally and from the, the rear that have been modified between um, looking at elevation changes, but a lot of plan changes here. And then our final, um, not keeping with the same traditional elevation that was presented last time, but major plan changes that do um, really make for a strong um, uh, plan 
here an elevation that would fit beautifully in the context. We do want to evolve the street. We do want to provide a home that new families can um, buy and would uh, meet the needs of these new families um, and, and would help with um, fitting into the context. There's a lot of two-story homes. We showed you the scales of all those. Uh, this design does meet the code that was uh, created in 2018. We meet the FAR. We meet the design findings. We meet the setbacks. We meet the FAR, the overall height. Um, so we're asking the Planning Commission to support the RDRC's approval of this home at 2125 Carmelita. And we thank you for your time. And I have a team here. It's not just me. We are here to answer any further um, questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we'll we save the questions until we finish the uh, public comment period. So, uh, Dara, are there people in the waiting room for public comment? Um, I, I assume there are, and so we need to um, open the public comment period formally. Um, I would entertain a motion to open the public comment. Yep. Oh, I see, actually, we did already. I'm sorry. Yeah, you did better. It's getting a little late. Uh, so we already opened it. So, Dara, are there people in the waiting room? Yes. Dave Saisi, um, you are unmuted, and you have two minutes to speak. We don't hear you yet. You probably need some unmuting. If you're on the phone, star six. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, now we do. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I was hoping that um, staff might be able to bring up one of the slides that um, Anna just brought up. It's out of the neighborhood compat compatibility materials. Um, it's the overview of the neighborhood with the two-story homes in yellow. Um, hopefully that's something that can be brought up quickly. But I did, I did want to comment on a couple things. Anna just mentioned that Thomas James Holmes wants to evolve Carmelita Drive, evolve the neighborhood. Um, it, you know, if, if you look at this slide that I'm asking to have brought up, um, I can go down almost every one of these homes to the left and the right of the proposed uh, project site and tell you that people have lived in these homes uh, for 30 plus years. We moved in in 1992. Ginny Henry moved in uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, Michael Quigley was here long before that. Um, so we have a vested um, interest in this neighborhood. And, and, and I'd like to say that we have made the neighborhood what it is um, in taking care of our homes. Um, I don't think any of us have plans on moving anytime soon. Um, my wife and I remodeled our home in uh, 2003, and we were able to accommodate um, a 2,700 square foot home. Um, it's listed as number two um, on the on the chart or the, the the slide that I'm interested in seeing, and it's no further back. In fact, Ginny's home actually goes back slightly further than ours. Um, our neighbor on the other side, um, their house goes well back further than ours. But we did have conversations with both of them about what the impact of us building a two-story home that exceeded um, the, the rear of their homes, how that would impact them. And, and, and we took to heart uh, their thoughts and, and, and we wanted to be sure that, um, you know, neighbors that we were going to live next to for, you know, the foreseeable future um, were happy in their homes and, and we could be happy in ours. So I, I think at the end of the day, um, there's, yeah, we did leave money on the table. We could have built a bigger home and there's, I'm sure, plenty of laws and rules that we could have hung our hat on. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, what was more important to us was our neighbors and um, the street itself. Um, I think there's much to be said for a developer that is going to come in here and build this home and not live in it and, and, and move on to the next one. Um, I appreciate the time. Uh, appreciate everything that Matt Grocott said. Uh, I don't think it can be said better. Uh, I appreciate the effort that Michael Quigley has put into this. I can only hope that you okay. feel his passion 
um, and, and the passion of this neighborhood. Uh, we are Carmelita Drive. We make up this neighborhood. Um, and I think I think we should have a right to decide, um, you know, what who, who what we live next to and what's going to be built in our neighborhood. So th okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We went over a little there. Dara, next caller, please. Christian Vizia, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. We never brought on the fucking slide. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Christian Vesha. I'm a co-founder of a group called Good Growth San Carlos. Uh, there's a mailing list of over 225 residents concerned with the negative impact of oversized homes on San Carlos residents and neighbors. Um, between 2016 and 2018, Good Growth San Carlos was very active on the issues that are before you today uh, here at the Planning Commission, which are establishing reasonable standards for home size and effective review process that would afford residents protection of their privacy, light, air, as well as safeguard the character of our neighborhoods. So in January 2019, San Carlos moved to a clearer far base standard for allowable home size and improved the review process by putting an architect on the RDRC. At the time, residents felt strongly that the RDRC rubber stamp proposals they reviewed and failed to address residents' concerns. I experienced that in my own neighborhood in 2015, which is what led me to co-found Good Growth San Carlos in 2016. So now we have a situation in which a more balanced RDRC initially denied this developer's proposal based on some clear and reasonable issues found in the zoning standards, significant concerns expressed by a large group of neighbors and residents, neighbors' loss of privacy and light in adjacent backyards, concern about compatibility of the new house with the neighborhood. Uh, in my experience, developers like TJ Homes don't really care about the impact their homes have on the neighbors or the character or coherence of a neighborhood for the simple reason that they don't plan to live there. Uh, they simply want to extract the last dollar from their investment. The fact that their redesign offered no reduction in size of the house, I think, demonstrate that's point clearly. Um, failing to grant the residents' appeal of the RDRC's second ruling Approving the design would send, I think, the wrong signal to residents and developers. To residents, I think it says we don't value your voice or the quality of your experience in your home. To developers, it says San Carlos review process doesn't have teeth. And with some time and money, you can circumvent a meaningful local review process. Come build more oversized homes in San Carlos. So I want to close by asking all of you to do what I think is the right thing for San Carlos residents and our city and support a meaningful review process that provides appropriate local influence over development. And that means voting to approve this residence appeal. I have to say, I really couldn't agree more with the comments of Matt or Michael on this. Um, and I've always wondered, you know, why would a review process um, favor out of town individuals in this case, that have no prior investment in the community and who don't plan to remain after the deed is done. Okay, we're over coming up on time. Residents we're, we're out of many time years now. and many decades. Thank you. All right, next caller, please. Gordy B, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. We don't hear you yet. Maybe you need to hit star six. We don't hear you yet. Hello. Yes, now we do. Um, briefly, we heard you. But now we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now we do. <laughs> please, please keep it to two minutes. Sure. Um, I'm Forty Burton. I've been here almost fifty years. My family's been in town for almost a hundred. My dad grew up here and was the town's mayor and councilman, and my grandfather was a longtime mayor and was active in countless activities here in town. Burton Park was named in his honor. Our family's been entwined with San Carlos forever. One of the main reasons we've stayed so long is its sense of community and charming neighborhoods with their delightful tree-lined streets. I fear that we are now losing a big part of that appeal because of the drive to build on every possible square inch of property. 
My wife and I live almost directly across the street from the project at 2116 Carmelita. Josh and Heather live next door to us at 2124, and Dave and Connie live a house away from the project at 2141. What we have in common is that we all have added on substantially to our houses. Because we wanted to accommodate our own needs while still making it fit into the neighborhood charm, we all built smaller than we could have, leaving a lot of square footage on the table. As you can see from Michael's um, um, uh, uh, artwork there, um, the massive proposed home is, a sh is, a sho is shoehorned into a small pie-shaped lot and is totally out of scale with the surrounding small cottage-style homes. Well, I'm sure TJH is a good company and builds quality homes. It is totally out of character for this lot. TJH has made bad, a bad, bad business decision when they purchased this particular lot, and ever since they've been trying to pass on this mistake to the neighborhood, who will forever have to pay the consequences. I'm afraid we're losing our uniqueness and charm to developers who scrape houses, build to the max, have no future stake in the neighborhood, and then move on to the next project. St. Carlos needs a precedence to set a precedence now on this project so that future developers will know there's a limit that this community will allow. And I wanna thank you so much. Dara, next caller, please. Thank you. No, not this time. Oh, not at this time, okay. Um, we actually have two more. Okay. Sorry about that. Caller ending in 256, you are allowed to talk. Hello, I, I don't hear you yet. Welcome. Hello? Yes, now I hear you. Please, please, two minutes. Yeah, hi. My name's Peggy Coop. I am a resident at 2200 Carmelita, just up the street from Michael Quigley. I just wanted to say that I have followed this. Uh, my family has lived here since 1973. Um, I recently uh, became a part owner inheriting the house at 2200 Carmelita. And I'd like to say that I appreciate what Michael Quigley and all the residents are doing on Carmelita because I, this is a very special and very great neighborhood. And I believe that what they're doing is, is it to extend to the future uh, a very fine principle of working with the neighborhood and the people who live in it. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Next caller, please. Ginny and Dennis, you are allowed to talk. Can you hear us? Yes, now we hear you. Okay, great, thanks. First of all, thanks uh, for the commission's time. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's time and effort on this and uh, allowing us to speak, so thank you very much. Uh, Jenny and I just like to convey, you know, everything that we've heard from the appeal uh, team, Michael, Josh, Tom, Matt, and uh, Dave as well, uh, his feedback. We sincerely, you know, support that. and. We don't want to spend a lot of time reiterating that. We we feel very strongly about that. So although our comments are short, please understand that that we feel extremely strongly, but we're being we want to be a little bit respectful with the time and so forth. So um, Jenny's been here over 27 years and again appreciates all the redesigns in the neighborhood that have taken place and the consideration that she's been shown and the input that she's been able uh, allowed to give. And again, it's really, you know, the mass that the entire team has been talking about is where the real concern is. And we would just ask the commission to uh, approve the residence appeal and um, move forward in that direction. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dara, are there any additional callers? Yes, Bill, um, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. Hi there, um, can you hear me first of all? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay, super. Hey, I have, again, um, as uh, Dennis just mentioned, although I don't have any new angles for you and I'm not going to take anywhere near two minutes here, I live substantially up the street on the right-hand side 
Uh, this home is nowhere in view of myself from my home. I would drive past it every day. And I just want the neighbors down to the street to know that, hey, the neighbors up the street are with you and support you as well. And, um, and you've done a wonderful job with everything you've done, and I fully support it. I think maybe in the future, the planning department might want to consider uh, what Palo Alto has done, and they've put a lot of square footage actually subterranean. So that way you can maintain uh, the look of a neighborhood. And if people really want the square footage, they can afford it. Entire stories are below ground with patios and beautiful egress up to grade level. There is a way to, to build a 4,000 square foot house and not have to look at the entire thing above grade. Anyway, another story for another time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dara, are there additional callers? None at this time. I'm giving it that few seconds. People sometimes jump in. I would entertain a motion to close the public comment period. I move that we close the public comment period. Well, second. The motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Giacopone? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. So now we're at the deliberation stage, and I have a, a way that I'd like to go about this, and that's um, to invite um, Commissioner Garvey and um, our RDRC representative, Eugene Sukai, who, had, who was, I think he's still online. I saw he was here earlier um, to, um, to give their perspective as a way to be somewhat organized. And then I also wanted to get um, some perspective from, um, from Greg, our uh, city attorney, on um, sort of what our purview and, um, and uh, what are the uh, boundaries of what, how we can move forward here. So um, um, maybe I'll start with um, Ellen and Eugene, and then um, and then I'll pose a question or two for Greg to kind of help us set the stage for the rest of the deliberations. All right, thank you very much, uh, Chair Roof. And also, uh, first, I want to begin by appreciating, uh, showing appreciation for Eugene Sakai, my colleague on the Residential Design Review Committee, who uh, is with us this evening. I did vote uh, at the last RDRC meeting to approve the project. And I just wanted to give a, a quick summary as to why I did that and what some of the factors I, I considered when I, when I cast that vote. Um, a, couple of, a, a couple of observations here. Um, one thing that impressed me about the project when they came back, when Thomas James came back at the last meeting is they there was no backsliding on the project. Everything that they had agreed to do, comments from the RDRC, suggestions from the neighbors, everything that they had uh, said they would do in the first project, it carried over with them to the second project. And this included uh, saving all the protected trees that had been initially proposed for removal, uh, filling in the, the lower courtyard, uh, moving the courtyard to the back and decking it so that there was no interference with the roots from the protected tree, uh, increasing the sill height. And then they came in back to the RDRC with the new design with additional changes that I felt were positive. Um, one of the most positive changes was the removal of those transom windows. Once they took those out, for me, the height of the house looked less because the windows weren't so tall. Um, they also removed the roof side gables and shortening that back by over six feet on the second story, um, I think really opened up the back more, no matter what perspective you looked at it from. And I really appreciated that they did that. Um, and it also more closely aligned the rear of the house 
with the uh, rear of the neighboring houses. One of the other changes that they made that I liked was that elongated front porch. When you stand on the street and you look at that house, because there's an elongated front porch, it just gives the feeling to me that the house looks a little bit smaller because the front is recessed behind that porch. These, these design changes addressed many of the concerns, not only from the RDRC, but from the Planning Commission at our previous meeting and from many of the neighbors. And quite frankly, this house is much better because of all of the comments from the neighbors. So I really appreciate the involvement uh, for a long period of time uh, for all of all of the neighbors in this uh, on this project. I walked up and down the street. It is a big house that's going in, but so are all of the other newer homes on this street. So to me, the size of this home isn't any bigger than anything else that's already on the street. And it's not any taller than anything else that's on the street. The street, in my opinion, has a real variety of house styles, house types, and house sizes. Um, and, and it just seems like it would fit into the mix. One of the other factors, frankly, that I considered is the house meets all of the codes. There's a lot of codes and uh, staff went over them and uh, Thomas James Holmes went over some of them uh, and the house meets all of those codes. Um, and that was very important to me. Um, so at the end of the day, I looked at all of that and I believe that this house will be I think we lost our commissioner. I think we did. Ellen, we don't hear you. So um, maybe we can um, move on to um, comments from Eugene. And then if Ellen had any um, additional, we can circle back. Ellen, we missed the last 30 seconds. Oh, I, I see. I, something must have happened with my internet. So uh, the house met all of the codes and for me, I believe this house will be a nice addition to the evolution of the street. And these are some of the big reasons why I voted to approve the project. And I'd be happy to go over this in more detail or uh, go into some of the lower, lesser factors that I considered. Uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to um, summarize why I voted for the project. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Eugene. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner Garvey. I'm uh, going to pretty much follow your lead in uh, sharing with the Planning Commission tonight uh, the evolution of my thinking on this project. Um, we have, well, I, I've been on the RDRC since 2018, and uh, Thomas James Holmes has been a frequent applicant uh, before for our commission. Um, I think I've I've seen a version of this design um, probably as many as a dozen times uh, during my tenure on the commission, uh, where they proposed uh, some version of this courtyard plan um, on many different lots in San Carlos, and generally um, this design works pretty well on on most of the lots in San Carlos. And uh, the RDRC and, and myself typically have been able to make the findings uh, for approval. Um, however, uh, having seen this project at the RD RDRC three separate times this year, uh, starting back in May of this year, I believe, uh, the first two times I could not make the findings. I voted to continue the project two times uh, for various reasons. Um, primarily because of the uniqueness of this lot and the neighbors have done an excellent job as they have in previous hearings of explaining uh, why this lot is unique in San Carlos, uh, not necessarily to their neighborhood, but really in comparison to the standard San Carlos lot. And um, in hearing their feedback and, and considering their feedback carefully, I found it to be quite convincing. Um, 
having looked really closely at the geometry of this lot, uh, the scale of the adjoining homes, um, finding D was, was uh, a finding that I could not make uh, on two separate occasions initially with the originally proposed designs. However, um, when it came to the third time that this project appeared at the RDRC, I was able to make the findings, uh, finding D in particular for the various, for the reasons which I'll spell out here. And some of these have been covered, um, but I'll, I'll reiterate here. Um, first of all, I felt that in terms of scale, finding D talks uh, primarily about scale relative to adjoining properties. And I felt that this prop, this project with the revisions that you see here tonight worked worked adequately with regard to scale. Um, it's, it's floor height, it's ceiling heights on both floors are basically nine feet. Uh, and the RDRC has approved um, taller houses um, in similar situations um, many times previous. So I felt the ceiling heights were, were modest. Um, they, the applicant made some, some notable changes to the roof line as to uh, minimize shadow and bulk impacts on the rear yards. Um, they pulled in the second floor about seven feet um, as to minimize the, uh, the impact of the second floor upon adjoining neighbors. I briefly considered that they could have done a bit more to the second floor. Um, they have a pretty modest program on the second floor, basically three bedrooms and, and two full baths, but they also have a laundry room and a loft. And so it, I, I briefly deliberated whether we could ask them to remove the laundry in the loft or, or place them on the ground floor to further minimize the second floor. But I ultimately decided that that would be an unreasonable ask, that they weren't, that that would be a, a bit too much given the context of all the other changes that they've made. Um, finally, I the thing that also I think really pushed me over the edge was, was a discussion with the city attorney, who I understand you're going to speak with also, and I'm grateful that he's here, um, because the city attorney um, was very helpful in clarifying the purview of the RDRC. Um, there was a lot of talk from the neighbors about floor area and why, you know, why the developer came back time and time again with the house that was within a foot or two of the maximum floor area. And I contemplated that, but the city attorney clarified for me that a reduction in floor area is beyond the purview of the RDRC, that it was not something we could ask for. Um, and so with that in mind, the only things that we could look at with regard to scale were things like the roof line design, floor to ceiling heights, um, you know, things that I've already touched on. And I think Andrea also tonight in her presentation uh, reiterated something that I also found compelling and convincing, which is that we're charged with reviewing a proposal against what any other new home could be, given the zoning restrictions and, the, and the, basically the guidelines for any 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 site in San Carlos. And so, you know, that was also convincing. If you, if you think about what the developer could have proposed and what they had proposed in the past um, and, and what that could be in terms of its relative impact to neighbors. Um, you know, I feel that this design is, is within the guidelines of what we can and should approve. Um, so I think given the, the, the boundary conditions that, that were outlined by the city attorney, Andrea, and then also the cooperation of the developer uh, throughout this process. I think initially they were perhaps a bit uncooperative, but it became more cooperative towards the end. Um, I factored all of that in and then ultimately was able to uh, flip my no vote to a yes. Thank you. And as you allude, I, I would like to invite, um, well, first I want to say that our planning commission decision and deliberations are entirely um, independent of what the RDRC reviewed. It's a de novo assessment that we are charged with making. And so um, uh, uh, how Ellen, uh, Commissioner Garvey will vote, uh, you know, is um, yet to be seen. Um, and um, it's a new, a new assessment. Um, but I would like to have um, Greg Rubens, our city attorney, uh, delineate the, um, the, the purview question that Eugene so clearly um, raised. 
as it applies to the planning commission and um, uh, to help us understand um, particularly the room we have to request uh, that square footage be reduced if we feel, felt that was necessary to um, achieve uh, the uh, criteria D of, um, of the massing for that particular lot, which is unique. Greg? Thank you, Chair Roof. Um, I think that was a, a good introduction. Um, yeah, first of all, I, um, you already said it, but this deserves reminding that um, when when something is appealed from the RDRC to the Planning Commission, it's a de novo review, which means a, a new look at it uh, um, using with the same facts and information that you're presented with. Um, and so I think um, with that, I think that the, the public um, pointed out, I think that the the relevant um, design criteria, um, but, but you have to look at the entire ordinance, which talks about the scope of design review, um, and that's 18.29.050. I think that's covered in the, in the staff report. And the purpose of design review is to kind of have, you know, it's, it's spelled out in, in planning uh, terms, but it's, I think, generally to, to create um, good design in our, in our city for new development. Um, the uh, design review criteria D um, talks about avoiding big differences in building scale and character between developments on adjoining lots in the same zoning district. So I think the public is focused on that um, that uh, criteria as the the most important one that they they believe they have the strongest argument on. Um, but you have to juxtapose that with 18.29.080 conditions of approval. So I think there's there is a bit of a misplaced focus on a house that is up to the maximum floor area that's now allowed in in our zoning districts. And it was pointed out that it was reduced um, about three years ago. Um, and and you have to kind of have a an eye for legislation and how how it's worded and why it's worded in a certain way. So on 18.29.080, it puts, there's the design criteria above in the code, but later on there's a, there's a pretty significant restriction on the purview of the, of the review of design review by whoever is reviewing the design, not just the RPRC, it's all the planning commission. And if this were to be appealed to the city council, they'd be governed by the same limitation. Um, and it says, the, the, com the commission can impose conditions that are reasonably related to the application and deem necessary to achieve the purposes of this chapter, which is 18.29, that's the chapter. Uh, and then it goes on to say they may not impose requirements, excuse me, I, I've skipped and deem necessary to achieve the purposes of this chapter and to ensure compliance with the applicable criteria and standards established by this title. And when you use the word title, we are talking about the entire zoning code. That is Title 18 of the, of the city's code. So that is really referring to the what you can build in, in town. And just to use a hypothetical for purposes of the discussion, that means that you can't say, we don't like your design because it's a two-story house um, and the houses next door are both one story. Um, it, the title says you can have a two-story house. So we allow two-story houses. Design review is not designed to shrink down houses to the smallest common denominator. It's to get good design. Then the, the next sentence in this restrictive paragraph says they may not impose requirements pertaining to use or that are more restrictive than the standards set forth in this title, back to the title, the zoning code, or a valid use permit or variance if such conditions would require a reduction in residential density or the floor area ratio of a proposed project. So that I think is pretty specific to say that the design review of a project is not designed to 
make the structures smaller. It's designed to make the, the design compatible and reasonable and meeting with the standards um, of, of good design in our community. So I think if you read those two together, and this is basically what I said to the RDRC at the lower level, that when you read the two together, yes, you can look at the compatibility finding under, under D um, and try to avoid big differences in building scale, but you have to do that without re re reducing the floor area of the project. And you can't create through design review more restrictive standards than in the zoning ordinance. That's my read of the code. And so I think that's why it, it it's more limited um, than it seems sometimes when you look, when you're just looking at the design criteria, because you have to point out, you have to go back to the limitations that, that are in here. And again, back, back to the main concept of this is to have good design. Um, and if you look at the staff report, I think the staff report addresses from a staff perspective, from a planning perspective, where they felt they could make the findings uh, and and uh, recommend that um, you know that you could make these findings. So that's the input I have on how you, how we should be looking at these types of, of uh, design review projects and including controversial ones like this. And I, I certainly understand everyone who spoke concerns, but I um, I think the the um, I think we have to kind of look really at what the code is designed to do and 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 the restrictions that are placed on you. I'm available for any questions that people need clarification. Okay, um, I'll, I'll lead off um, and ask the question that often we're faced as a planning commission with applying a general rule to a to a sort of an exceptional circumstance and that sort of gives the room for um modifying so that it's appropriate for that unique circumstance and the unique circumstance here um as has been pointed out is sort of the the pie-shaped lot uh which increases you know which provides a special situation and so maybe the standard floor area ratio um because of that special circumstance is there room to um, kind of go down that path of, um, of if we wanted to? Well, not for the floor area ratio, but for design, you, you can, so, which I think is kind of what happened with the redesign. I mean, that was what was attempted by the developer. If you're not satisfied with that um, and you, you think that there's some other design features that, that could be made, that's within your purview, but it can't be directed at the FAR. It has to be directed at design. Okay, thank you. Um, so, in other words, of looking at this, if, if you said, "Hey, I don't like the uh, the the there's there's too much of a the building appears too bulky," as you heard before from the rear yard of a property, um, that the they could redesign it and come back with the exact same floor area, in with in an attempt to not make it as bulky, um, if that's the concern that you have. Yeah. So it's not it's not the size of the house; it's the the bulkiness and design and and design features. Okay, thank you for clarifying that the the we have a a um, a bubble that we can squish in different directions, but um, it, it's not in our purview to um, yeah, yeah, to reduce yeah, the no. square footage. That's um, pretty much that's a pretty apt description of my read of, of the okay the, the design. I think I heard Commissioner Bradley um, yes. speak. Uh, speak up. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm impressed by everyone I've heard here on this <laughs> project tonight. I want to say that I'm in my sixth year now on the Planning Commission and spent two years on the RDRC. I think this is the most difficult uh, residential project that I've been a part of making a decision on and it's come back several times as you've heard and some of us have changed our minds somewhat as we've gone along and heard of, heard these comments I I'm I'm emotionally swayed by the by the neighbors uh, and the community I know I drive through it frequently it's a great a great street uh, 
the problem is the lot shape. I, it hit me the first thing because I lived on a lot like that in Michigan for a while, a big colonial house on a pie-shaped lot with hardly no backyard for my five children. Uh, well, and one thing that uh, the, the builders did do is cut down, I think, on Mr. Sakai's suggestion, uh, lower the uh, ceiling height to nine feet. And I think I had suggested earlier, and this is still could be a possibility, is to lower the the second floor to eight foot ceiling heights and that would help to reduce the bulk and there's certainly room that they could cut a couple of feet off of uh, those back rooms and uh, at least make it appear less huge to the neighbors when they're in their backyards um, so again it it meets the criteria. I can say in my findings, I would support the criteria D finding in them. And I appreciate what the builders and the architect have done to make changes that fit in. I think once, once the building is built, um, people will get used to it and, and it'll fit in with the, uh, rest of the houses as I see them. And I've looked at, I've looked at the site several times. Uh, so I can support the project at, at this point, if the rest of you do. Thank, thank you. you. I, um, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Clements, would you like to go next? Thank you, Chair. And first, I wanted to thank all of the neighbors who obviously care so passionately for their lovely street. Um, it's so nice to hear people like advocate for their neighborhood and know their neighbors by their first names and come and support people who aren't even, you know, like their next door neighbor. Um, and I wanted to disclose that I did visit this weekend with Michael and Carol Quigley and they were so kind as to show me their lot and to walk me as a, um, uh, down the street and show me also the neighboring lot on the other side of the proposed development site. So I, it was helpful to see what is there today and to see, to imagine that, you know, something quite a bit different is going to be or could be there next door. And then that, you know, this affects people who have been there for decades. Like there is no doubt that change coming to a neighborhood um, with small setbacks, which the entire the entire street, very small setbacks, right? So it is difficult when development comes. And um, so I really, really do appreciate that. And I really do appreciate Michael's generosity and kindness in trying to explain their points of view. So I wanted to do like that. Um, Another conversation I just I've, I've been thinking through is just the difference between homeowners doing remodels and out of town developers doing remodels. And I, I think the important thing is that we need to think about what is the product of the remodel um, rather than who's doing it and are they doing it for the right motivations? Um, because I think that's a slippery slope, um, even though I don't. You know, I don't support $4 million homes going up all over the city, for sure. Um, really, our, our charge here is to think through what's the compatible design and what's, you know, compliant with the code. And I, I do really appreciate Greg's um, reading and interpretation of what we can do and what we can't do. And um, very much appreciate um, Eugene's um, and Ellen's reciting um, their thoughts because I know they've been with this project for so long um, and other similar ones with TJ Holmes in Eugene's case. So um, Greg's reading of the code to me makes a lot of sense as to what our charge is and what our purview is and what it is not. And that is how you end up getting, you know, homes that 
are capable under the code and that it is not just um, that it, having smaller homes on either side does not inhibit um, achieving what is possible under the code if that's what the city decided it wanted. I think um, it's potentially still an open issue if um, as to how that, um, if it is perfect, I mean, no code is perfect and no design parameter is perfect um, as to different dimensions of different lots. Um, I guess we may want to discuss or suggest that, you know, the 2018 effort, if, if we think that irregularly shaped lots or pie shaped lots or somehow um, that this was a much more difficult than usual process because of the shape of the lot, and that that somehow implies something about the code that we're working under, that somehow that should be uh, edited, that that's maybe part of the motion that we consider today. Um, so I would welcome other commissioners and um, Eugene's thoughts on that as well. So, um, so those are some of my thoughts as I listen to all the facts here again today and deal with this emo difficult emotional issue of how um, how just one home can change a block and um, I'm sympathetic. And I, I was really hoping that there weren't too many projects like this. <laughs> glad to say, glad to hear this is an unusual <laughs> occurrence because I know this is really difficult um, for a lot of people. So those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. Should I go next or would uh, would one of the other commissioners who hasn't spoken yet like to, I guess that would be Commissioner Iacopone. Um Thank you, Chair. I'll, um, I won't reiterate all of the comments that um, my fellow commissioners uh, shared, I think, um, or I won't repeat them at length. I would say we worked very hard in 2018 to make a, a transformational change to the zoning code with regard to scale and massing. Uh, we knew it wasn't going to be perfect. Um, I think we were proud of it at the time, and I remain proud of that work. And I would acknowledge that TJ Holmes um, has worked right up to the limit, uh, but also I would also reflect that since I first, uh, we first engaged in this project, they have taken on input and made the changes that I think staff um, shared this evening. Um, I, thanks again to Eugene and Ellen for your considered uh, comments earlier. That was helpful to hear your thinking. Um, and also a, a big thank you to uh, City Attorney Greg Rubens. Um, also very useful to help connect the dots as to how the different elements come together and our purview vis-a-vis -vis creating good design, but not impinging on the right to maximize plural ratio under the code. Um, you know, I guess that the last time we voted on this, I was on the fence. I said so. It's probably in the record. Um, and I uh, voted against the project. The project has moved on. I am even more deeply empathetic for the neighbors um, and their passion. Um, and, you, you know, you are what San Carlos is about. Um, and I'm thankful for all of you to live here. Um, I'll say for my part, uh, I'm in a position where um, I would support the, the project and um, not support the appeal. Thank you. And I'll, um, I would like to say that I agree with the neighbors that this house is too large for the rear there. Um, considering the shape of the lot. Um, and I would love to be able to toe the line that the neighborhood compatibility is a an effective uh, 
criteria that we can um, use to guide development in the city. And so um, if we um, allow this project to go forward, um, I think it weakens our position there. So those are big concerns for me. Um, however, um, I do hear what the city attorney is telling us about um, the extent of what we can ask for and we can ask for changes in the shape, um, the, the way the mass is distributed, but without reducing it um, substantially. Uh, and so that's exactly what we did in our last, in, in the last planning commission meeting on this house, where we asked for, um, when we pointed out that the um, interior patio uh, was occupying a lot of square footage and, um, uh, and causing the rear of the house necessarily to be pushed back further than it could be. Um, and they did make that change and pulling, pulling into the rear, the second story rear in by seven feet is um is a pretty big, uh, is a pretty big uh, improvement in my eyes. I think the, the neighborhood view is also substantially improved. Um, you know, that's not the, the main concern on the table here, but, uh, but, the, but we did um, achieve an improvement of the neighborhood view. So um, I guess I also want to say that um, I agree with Commissioner Clements that, uh, you know, it's our job to kind of make sure that we're focusing on the product of the um, of the approval, not the motivations uh, behind it. Uh, those um, those are those are um, difficult to uh, to act against, um, and to act on, um, and uh, inappropriate, I think, to act on the motivations so much. Um, and I'm also concerned if we were to try to go beyond the framework that the title, the zoning code and title as, as, as Greg explained to us, if we're sort of qualitatively deviating from what is defined there, then that makes it very difficult to be consistent in the future. And so if you force one house to be smaller than the standards, uh, then um, uh, how do you ensure fairness? And so if, if somebody buys one of the nearby houses, uh, are they going to be stuck with the same thing? You know, is this a, um, a and so um, so that I do see the purpose of sort of having the quantitative criteria and the overall zoning code provide the framework. Um, and then we have some flexibility within that. But um, uh, so I guess that's all leading up to me um, kind of coming to the painful um, position uh, that, uh, you know, especially based on the limited purview that we have to address the, the floor area ratio, to ask for a reduction in that. Um, I don't see much more that could be done uh, without reducing the floor area ratio. I think they've done a really, Thomas James Holmes has done a really good job of doing the best they could um, while keeping the maximum floor area ratio. And I wish that they would have been willing to go less, but that would have been sort of, uh, um, but that's not something we can um, request in my opinion. So I guess I've um, come to the um, to the point where um, I would um, support the project moving forward, which means denying the appeal. This is my, it's where I'm headed. So um, do we have further comments from the planning commission commissioners? Are we getting to the point where we might um, look at the, um, do we have a, a, a staff, did you prepare a motion that um, we can? Um... Let me bring that up um, just one moment. Actually, could I look at one more slide? Before the vote, um, the overhead, I guess it was in um, TJ Holmes' presentation that had the aerial view of the new um, footprint relative to the other neighbors. That shows the reduction in, in depth. Yeah, that was raised a couple of times. It'd be nice if that if that picture could be put into the record. Uh, actually, I, I, I welcome viewing it again now. Yeah. 
Does Thomas James Holmes have that or does it, does the staff have that? Do we have a copy of that? Let me just um, pull that. Thank okay, you. that would be easiest if, if we could have the staff bring it forward. I believe you can see the presentation here, right? So let me yes, move through what I think is it. Um, just let me know when I hit the slide that you're looking for. It shows both neighboring properties and where the property lines go back to. Oh, I think it might be coming after the shadow study, if I recall correctly. Oh, I also found the shadow helpful. studies very helpful. Thank you for those. Let's see, what is that? Is it this one? No, I think it's that one. Went away. Yeah, I think it's um must be this one. Can you see that? It is, yes, it's that okay. one. Okay. Can you um can you clarify the distance on the between the right hand properties closest um lateral wall? on the back um, before their tree. And then the, the back of the proposed development. Thank you for zooming in. Staff, can you clarify that? I'm gonna ask Andrea to jump in. Sure, I'm, I'm having difficulty understanding which walls. Of the I'm trying to just figure out how much farther the house extends past the right hand property, which I think is Jeannie's property. Sure, let me measure it out. Thanks. What's complicated is if you take uh, both the neighbors on either side of uh, 2125, the, the furthest corner of each of them and draw a line across it uh, is right on top of uh, where the designer has uh, got the building ended, ending now. But if you take the closest corner, it's way off, right. of course. Right, because it's kind the, of the U-shaped. That's due to the key shape. Line. Yeah. Right. Or pie shape, I mean, yeah. Well, because the other homes aren't either straight across or, you know, right on this angle. Yeah, they're just a little less just a composed, uh, you know, uh, the way it turns out. Right. So I was just, I was just trying to figure out that right hand differential between the end, the close end of the building before the, I guess it's an orange tree, and um, how much wall will be, um, you know, facing the backyard. Yeah. Not, I, I don't, I don't know if it's material on my vote, but I just trying to figure out exactly what I'm voting for. Yeah, I'm just opening against. the um, program to measure it. One second, I'm almost there. Thank, Thank you. you. So it looks like about 20 feet to the rear of the house on the first floor. Got it. So from that, I can't cursor. So <laughs> from where that intersects, where the, it looks like the white. Yeah, I can't describe it. <laughs> is it the, the corner on the right side that's closest to the tree? Yes. Okay. And then back to the lighter gray shade, you're saying that's about 20 feet. So 
I was measuring from the neighbor's cor rear corner on the left mm -hmm. to the, I'm sorry, the neighbor on the right, but the left side of their, yeah, that corner to that corner. the rear wall of the proposed house, the end of the gray is about, okay. I'm getting like 21 feet. Okay, and how about to the hatched, which is the second story profile, right? Sure. Looks like it's 12 feet, 12, four inches yeah. approximately. Yeah, it's, it's already <laughs> on there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see it. Yeah. Well, Commissioner Clements, where are you going you. with this? Is this something? Are you on? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I, you know, it is an imposing differential there. Yeah. I'm not sure that it changes the fact that it is is now much more reasonably sized than it was, or that it conforms to code, or that our job is not to interpret design such that it um, the reduces the FAR. Our job is not to inhibit housing development by designing it to death. Yeah. That's, that's called being anti-housing. I mean, I guess I would be interested if there was a a redistribution of the square footage that would result in a better situation. But it seems to me that the changes that have been brought forward have done pretty good in that department. And, uh, and, we, and we have the sort of the, we got that advice from the RDRC and they're probably more professional at that sort of assessment than we are. So right. we, we exactly. And so I, I kind of put a fair amount of weight that within the constraints of how are we gonna um, position this maximum amount of floor space, um, this seems like the, the current plan seems about as good as it's going to get. I don't see, nobody has raised, has suggested anything uh, about redistribution that would be very helpful, except for, although Commissioner Bradley did mention lowering the, the ceiling height from uh, from nine to eight feet, but uh, I don't know what the, um, that would be significant or the, and the implications of that. If we, um, no, I, I agree and put a great deal of stock in Eugene's um, professional assessment. And, um, you know, so if, you know, if it were in our purview to say, hey, in this pie shaped lot, the maximum floor area ratio, you know, that would otherwise be allowed isn't appropriate, then, you know, I think we'd be having a different conversation here. I'd be, I'd be thinking differently. It's, it's the, um, but given that constraint, um, I don't see a, um, I don't see anything, um, any path forward other than saying that it, um, that the project um, meets our, our rules. That's my opinion, but we have a yet to vote. Do we have additional discussion before we, um, consider a motion? Staff, could you put up a, uh, could you put the, the motion up? So we don't see it. I guess you know this, Lisa. We don't see it yet. Sorry about that. I'm just having a little bit of trouble getting back to our presentation. Just give me one moment. Okay. Try to bring that back up. It's also on page 71 of your planning packet, the formal motions there. Lisa, tell me if we should just revert, if we should just look at our plan, our packets. Yes, I think for now, if you can do that, um, because I'm trying to look in the original presentation and I'm not sure I see a motion. Okay. Um, scrolling through this packet takes a minute or two. Okay. Yeah, actually, Andrea, maybe you can confirm I don't see a, a motion. That's okay. We can verbalize it once we get yeah, once okay. we get the. Um... Uh, 
I'm willing to uh, you make got a motion. Okay, um, I would entertain a motion. I move that the Planning Commission deny the appeal and grant design review approval, the demolition of an existing one-story single-family home and construction of a new single-family home with a first floor of 1,695 square feet and a second story of 1,326 square feet at 2125 Carmelita Drive as proposed based on the required findings contained in the staff report and subject to the attached conditions of approval. Do we have a second? Good second. I have a motion and a second. Any last comments before we ask for a roll call? Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Commissioner Iacopone? Yes. Commissioner Bradley? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Ruth? Yes. Well, thank you very much, everyone who was involved in this. It, that's a difficult issue. And I think we had a high quality discussion and analysis, and I really appreciate that, hearing all the perspectives. The staff did a really good job of putting together the, um, giving us a, an efficient overview of what, what was on the table now. And uh, Greg did a great job of outlining our, our boundaries. And um, the RDRC did a lot of great legwork on this. And I think the RDRC's work on this has really made the project a lot better. Maybe not as good as we hoped for, but uh, but as good as, as as much as we could ask for. And this is a this this decision is um, appealable also um, within ten days um, up to the city council. Thank you. Moving on to the next item: reports, correspondence, and general information. Letter A, report on recent city council actions. Lisa? Uh, yes, Chair Ruth. Um, uh, since the last time you met, the city council did um, approve the second reading of the ordinance to extend the RDRC notification from 150 feet to 300 feet. Um, so that will become the effective date of that. Uh, maybe Andrea has that off the top of her head, but um, that, come, that typically becomes effective 30 days after the second reading of the ordinance. So it'll be effective uh, starting in January, just with our furlough. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks. And that's all I have for recent city council actions this evening. Okay, do we have any planning commission comments or reports? Any word on when city hall will, when we'll have meetings in the council chambers? again uh commissioner bradley uh staff does not have any um new information on that we're still operating um uh in this particular format until further notice as soon as i do receive any indication of any change i'll, I'll be sure to pass that on to the commission thank you mm -hmm. other comments or reports Moving on to C, correspondence. Uh, staff is um, in receipt of no other uh, correspondence other than what's, that has been transmitted in the packet this evening. Okay. Planning staff, planning staff comments, reports, and updates of current projects. Uh, yes. So for uh, this evening, I would like to share that the next planning commission meeting um, that will conclude the meetings for this year um, is on December 20th. Um, we do have an item that has been continued um, uh, on this evening that will be brought back. And we have um, another item um, on Old County Road, and this is a minor amendment to an existing um, uh, plan development um, plan development application that will come forward. I believe the address is 1129 Old County Road. So that is on the agenda for December 20th. And then the first meeting in the new year, um, which is landing on January 3rd, I just wanted to confirm uh, we were thinking about bringing forward a study item 
but we are going to do that actually on the second meeting in January. But suffice to say that the first meeting in January on January, January 3rd is indeed canceled. And then we'll come back on January 18th, which is a Tuesday. And one of the items that we will have before the Planning Commission is a study session um, on SB9, which is a recently um, approved state legislation regarding lot splits and duplexes in the single family uh, zoning uh, districts. So we do wanna have a study session with the Planning Commission, which would then be short, shortly followed by a study session with the city council to get your input um, on some policy questions that we have as we go forward and draft, start to draft an ordinance in response to that. Um, and that's all I have for this evening, other than I can share with the commission that staff is going to be working on creating objective standards beginning next year. Um, this is objective standards um, that we do want to set in place to give more uh, clarity and guidance on um, applications for residential projects, as well as um, we also have an RFP out right now to follow through on one of the city council's strategic objectives to create a, a plan for the downtown area. So we will be embarking on a specific plan project um, at the end of the first quarter uh, next year for the downtown plan. And I'll have more to share on that as we sort of head, in, head into the new year. Um, but I think those are the big announcements for this evening. Thank you. And thank you. Well, with that, I think we can adjourn our meeting. Thank you, everybody. Great job, Chair. That was uh, great job, Chair. Great. Yeah, really good job. Good, good job. Chair. Okay. Good thank you, staff. Thank you. Staff. Thank you, thank you. Good job. I wanted, I wanted to commend especially Andrea. I know how much work she has put into. The item, the second item Thank that came so before much. us tonight and how well you've worked with everybody. It seems you've done an outstanding job. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yep, I'll look at that. <laughs> thank you, sure. Eugene, if you're still Eugene. there. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Well, good night, everybody.